Okay, before we get into the show, just need to have a bit of context. Uh, some of you are going to be listening to this on the audio stream, and some are watching on YouTube. I'm just going to do one intro, so for those listening, uh, be aware that I'm talking to the people also watching on YouTube. Okay, I haven't actually done an intro for YouTube before, but I just wanted to add some context because for a number of people, this uh, interview is quite controversial. They want to know why I'm talking to Laura Luma. They are not fans of her, but there are people who, who definitely want to hear from her. So anyway, I am going to give this uh, an intro. Okay, so the background to this is back earlier this year, I was the MC for the Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami. And there was a session between my good friend Alex Gladstein and the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey. And shortly after the session started, uh, a lady emerged from the crowd and was shouting at Jack Dorsey about censorship and being deplatformed and uh, no security dealt with it. So I was uh, left there thinking, shit, I better deal with this. So I went out and I spoke to Laura, uh, calmed her down and uh, advised her that we should walk away before security would grab her. And uh, but I didn't know who she was at the time. So we went to the side and I you know, asked her how she was. She was quite emotional and she explained she's Laura Luma. A name I knew, but I couldn't connect the dots. So uh, she explained her situation to me. Said she'd been deplatformed by Twitter and the banks, and she'd been using Bitcoin as a as a way to um, survive. And she asked if she could come on the show, and I said, "Fine, yeah, come on the show. We'll talk about your story." Then after that, I did my research and uh, looked in some of her background, her history on Twitter, some of her opinions, and to be honest, I personally found a lot of it quite distasteful. She's definitely from a spectrum of uh, politics that I don't agree with. I then put out on Twitter that I'm thinking of interviewing her, which saw a range of replies. Some people saying they would uh, not listen to the show at all, do not like Laura in the slightest. But other people wanted to hear from her, and I kind of like wrestled with it for a while. I spoke to my producers. They weren't totally keen on doing this either. Uh, but I decided to do it. You know, everyone deserves a, a voice. Well, that's what I felt like at the time. Everyone deserves a voice. So I said to Laura I would honour it. And when we were in New York, she came out and we did the interview. Now, listen, as we were doing the interview, though, I you know, I didn't enjoy the session. And, and there's a couple of reasons why. I'm usually inviting people on that I want to learn from or hopefully they learn or we discuss an important topic and we get something from it. We move the conversation forward. And I didn't, feel, I didn't feel like this really happened with Laura. I, I didn't enjoy the topics we were discussing. I really disagree with uh, a number of her opinions. I do think she is prejudiced. And also another thing, it made me realize that you know, some of her accusations re you know, required me to probably uh, have a fact checker there, someone like my producer Danny with a laptop checking some of her points, which you know, I didn't really have the ability to do. I looked up a couple of things on my phone and things that I think she was incorrect about. But I also, I was, when I was doing the interview, I was just like, this doesn't feel like a What Bitcoin Did show. This just feels like something else. Um, and part of me was like, I don't even want to release this, but I wasn't going to do that. You know, I'm not going to just dump the show or censor it or whatever people say. I'm, I'm going to put it out there, but I'm going to preface it by saying, look, yeah, I honoured an agreement to do a show, but I'm not a fan of Laura. I, I disagree with her, a, a number of opinions, and and I probably wouldn't have her back on the show. Um, now, I'm, I know there's other people going to be listening now are going to be saying, why are you even prefacing this? Why are you doing this? It's different. You don't this do this for your other shows. But the truth is, is that I think sometimes it's important to add context to conversations. Uh, and this is one I felt that, that needs it. And listen, just go on my YouTube. Go, go on to any of my interviews and look at the comments. It's very hard to keep everyone happy. You do interviews where people are like, that's your best interview ever. And then that will be followed by somebody saying, that's your worst interview ever. And then people like guests and don't like guests. And don't think I pushed them hard enough or think I pushed them too hard or think I'm an idiot. Like, it's really fucking hard to keep everybody happy. So I just do my best. I get guests on, I talk to them, I share my thoughts, I ask them questions, etc, etc. I just didn't like this show. I do not like Laura's opinions. I think she's prejudiced. I think she's divisive and aggressively so. I don't think she speaks with facts. I think she brings things to the table that are just incorrect. It's like, like the UK having no-go zones, uh, Muslim no-go zones. It's just bullshit. And I will happily go to any part of the country which is considered a Muslim uh, area, which is a, a no-go zone. And I'll go and take a photo there because they don't exist. But yes, I just don't want to tie myself up in this type of bullshit. It just isn't for me. So listen, if you ignore the show, cool. I don't really care because, like, great. And if you watch it and you get something from it, you don't get something from it, great, whatever. And if you want to write to me and give me your opinion, great. I'm, I'm willing to listen to all the feedback. But in hindsight, 
this isn't a show for what Bitcoin did. It's not a show for me and it's not a guess for me. And I'm sorry if that pisses people off. It's just not the kind of thing I want to do in the future. I do appreciate Laura coming on and Laura, you're probably going to see this or hear this and think, what the fuck are you doing, Pete? But like, I've said it to you, I said it to you. Some of the opinions that you hold are not the kind of opinions of someone I want to be friends with. I, I just don't like them. Um, but good luck to you. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate anyone supporting the show. Uh, I'm rambling on now. Um, but if you want to feedback, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Looking forward to hearing from what anyone has to say about this. All right. On to the show with Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi, Peter. I forgot to press record. <laughs> what a fucking idiot. Okay. Uh, this isn't going to be my most popular interview. Uh, after we met in Miami, uh, some people asked me to speak to you and I said to you, uh, I would do it and I, you know, I'd keep to my word. But uh, when I put it out on Twitter, there were some people who were vehemently against me talking to you. They said, I won't listen to that show. You shouldn't do that show. Yada, yada. So people not wanting me to do it makes me want to do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're going to agree on a lot today. <laughs> and, but I don't think we're going to disagree on everything. So I'm happy to have this conversation. And how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. No worries. You are a dangerous individual apart, according to Facebook. Yeah, amongst other things. So we met in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching, I was obviously hosting, I was watching the interview between Alex Gladstein, banking the unbanked he was uh, having with Jack Dorsey. And I see somebody come out and start yelling. And obviously it was you. And I you know, I didn't, hadn't made the connection at that point. I didn't know your whole backstory. Uh, I knew of you. I knew of the <laughs> story of chaining yourself to Twitter. Yeah. And uh, so I did my research afterwards. And um, there's things I definitely want to talk to you about. But mm -hmm. there's a lot I don't uh, agree with you on. Uh, let's, let's clear up Miami. I, um, I, got, I got death threats after Miami. I got threatened to be um, have my face smashed in with a hammer for yeah. violently assaulting you. I saw. I I don't felt like I violently assaulted you. No, I mean, look, you know, you were uh, you were uh, preventing me from hopping up on stage, and uh, I think from the camera angle, right, it looked like an assault, but you were kind of embracing me and I was hugging you. you were hugging me. You, you were hugging hug. me and you know telling me i you know i agree with you we'll come on my show we'll talk about it and you stay true to your word and i appreciate that because i think there's a lot to talk about especially in the bitcoin community and how the bitcoin community has to position itself and uh you know whether or not it's hypocritical to be embracing uh big tech executives like jack dorsey himself who has a long history of censoring people and shutting people down which is contrary to the philosophy of decentralization which is at the core of bitcoin Yes, this is um, this is a challenging topic. There's a lot of nuance to this, and I think we're going to work through some of it. Um, yeah. I am a fan of Jack Dorsey and what he's trying to achieve with Bitcoin. Uh, I have my issues with Twitter. I, I'm not sure how I feel about a, a sitting president being removed, being deplatformed. <laughs> Um, but I think it's challenging. Well, I'm not really sure how I feel about a sitting president being removed or the fact that the Taliban, right, the Taliban has access to uh, these social media sites. I mean, I definitely know how I feel about it. But look, I think that it's pretty absurd what's happening right now in, in our country and around the world where, you know, the leader of the free world is banned and then you have terrorist organizations, Islamic terrorist organizations that have access to these social media sites. And then people like myself who were just simply exposing anti-Semitism uh, banned, right, for, for criticizing an elected official and then having my own congressional campaign completely interfered with by the big tech social media giants in the middle of a pandemic. So I think the two issues at hand here is, yeah, what is free speech and, and should we... And should companies such as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube allow anything? And where is the consistency in the decision making? And I also have been, I mentioned to you before we started, there's a, a lot of people who are getting banned from YouTube. Uh, Brett Weinstein, who I've interviewed a couple of times, who I like most of his work. I don't agree with him on everything, but I really enjoy, enjoy talking to him. He has been removed now from YouTube. There's people in the Bitcoin community who've been removed from Twitter and YouTube. Uh, I, I try and understand how it works. I'm, you know, some more research I've got to do. But my assumption is for something like YouTube, you can't have people sat there manually watching every interview. So I'm assuming they're using algorithms, and the algorithms are reading the content, flagging it, and, and then there's a human decision, perhaps at some point. But I, I have no idea. But 
censorship is a big issue right now with large social media platforms. And I don't know the answer. I'm just here to talk to you about it. So we should probably, we should do the backstory. We should talk about what you've been through with regards to censorship. But before we get to that, the, the first question I really have for you is, um, free speech is all speech, of course, but in the realm of platforms or social media platforms, mm -hmm. should or do you believe that every single platform should allow anything be, to be said by anyone at any point? Or, or are there some limitations? I there? think that these, these are American companies, right? Uh -huh. Facebook, Twitter... Google, right? These are companies that were established here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And we have the Constitution, okay? And I believe that the First Amendment of the United States Constitution should apply to these, you know, they all have their terms of service. But they, where they go wrong is when they start creating policies surrounding so-called hate speech. Well, designating something as hate speech is contrary to the United States Constitution and rulings that have already existed, right, uh, by the United States Supreme Court in which they found that there's no such thing as a uh, hate speech exemption to the First Amendment of the United States. And so I think that, you know, a good policy would be to have it so that uh, all constitutionally protected speech, right, even things that are offensive or something that somebody may, you know, view as racist or hateful. Hate is very subjective uh, to be to be allowed online. Where I draw the line is uh, the incitement of violence. I think that incitement of violence is a bannable offense. Uh, but uh, you know, these companies would avoid themselves a lot of grief if they would just adopt constitutionally uh, protected speech uh, terms of service policies. How do you feel about companies, private companies, having the right to choose? who can use their platforms and who can uh, who can frequent their businesses. So, for example, I have free choice who can come on my show and if I wanted to, I could cut parts of the interview. I, that, that would be my choice. I think the problem that we're dealing and, with sorry, here... Also, let's just talk about, say, if, if, if you were to run any particular business where customers come in, do you have the free choice? To, should you have the free choice? for who can come and use your business. The thing is, we're not talking about regular companies, right? We're not talking oh. about small companies. We're, you know, if you look at this in the scheme of the United States economy, right? We have an economy that's a little over $21 trillion, okay? When you combine the wealth of companies like Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, Google, Microsoft, it's upwards of $8 trillion, you know? So over a third of our economy is essentially dominated by a couple men who also happen to be Democrat Party mega donors in Silicon Valley in the tech industry, who have created this abusive relationship uh, with the American people and really all internet users around the world, in which our United States economy is now completely dependent on you know these five tech companies, and so we're not talking about you know a small business relationship. We're talking about. Uh, companies that are now creating packs and contracts with governments, creating uh, contracts with uh, world leaders, okay, uh, being invited to the White House to create um, interfaces for the distribution of information during the COVID pandemic, right? You know, these are not uh, just, you don't really have a choice in this day and age. And so the problem is, with Section 230, they're abusing their Section 230 privileges, which is why I'm an advocate of completely repealing Section 230. Explain Section 230, because I've got people who listen to the show from all around the world. Well, with these with these companies, right, Section 230 was, was created, uh, Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act was uh, created long before these companies um, were ever in existence. And it distinguishes platform versus publisher protections. And mm -hmm. so basically these companies are immune to third-party lawsuits from content that their users post because they, you know, they, they, they call themselves platforms. Where you become a publisher is when you begin editorializing your content, right? And so we know, we know we've seen in the Project Veritas undercover videos, Project Veritas, where I used to work, we've seen Twitter employees and Twitter executives and even Mark Zuckerberg himself, who was secretly recorded during one of his uh, company meetings, right, uh, talking about how 
they have too much power. They know they have too much power, and they are implementing algorithms to specifically target conservatives, to target Trump supporters, and to target anybody who challenges their agenda or the agenda of the progressive uh, radical left. Um, and so this isn't really even up for discussion because it's out in the open. You know, I sued Facebook and I sued Twitter, I sued Google, I uh, have, have sued these companies, um, and my case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And a few months ago, the Supreme Court declined to hear my case um, in which I argued that these companies, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Apple, were behaving as state actors. So they've really transcended the role of your typical private company, and they're mm -hmm. now behaving as state actors, right? They have admitted that they themselves have more power than any elected body or any elected official. When Jack Dorsey can, with the click of a button, decide to deplatform the leader of the free world in the middle of one of the most contentious election cycles before a transition of power has, has even taken place, right? He's completely undermining uh, the, the American electoral process, right? When, when Mark Zuckerberg gets to decide with the click of a button that Donald Trump and all of his supporters and anybody and anyone who attended a rally in January 6th in D.C., um, is a domestic terrorist and should be banned, right? He's suppressing an election process and interfering in the free speech First Amendment rights. We have a First Amendment protection in this country to peacefully assemble. Mm -hmm. and, and no one person in the world, regardless of where they're located, right? They all just happen to be located in Silicon Valley, should have that power. And so uh, this is why I've aggressively uh, been a critic of people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. This is why I handcuffed myself to the Twitter headquarter office. This is why I went to Jack Dorsey's home and projected the names of banned individuals onto his garage in San Francisco. Because they're, they're, they're committing human rights violations. And that was the whole reason why I confronted Jack Dorsey at the Bitcoin 2021 conference in Miami, right? I thought it was a perfect opportunity to expose um, in front of really a community, the Bitcoin community. I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, you know, they lean to any particular, you know, political ideology. It's quite mixed, right? I use Bitcoin, right? We're and a diverse group. We're, you're a pretty diverse group. Um, and I have a lot of friends who attended the Bitcoin uh, conference who are in the, you know, right-wing movement. Um, and so, you know, when he was on stage speaking with Alex Gladstein about banking the unbanked, and Alex Gladstein calls himself right, a human rights activist. That's mm -hmm. his whole. That's his whole. His whole shtick. How do you how do you reconcile having Jack Dorsey speak at a Bitcoin conference about banking with the unbanked, unbanked when he runs Cash App? Right. You know, I'm banned from Cash App. He has debanked me. I have been debanked and deplatformed. I have been banned by Chase Bank. I've been banned by by uh, by Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, GoFundMe, right? The list goes on and on. How how can you have an intellectually honest conversation when you're speaking to a man who claims to be a supporter of Bitcoin, right? Because he's accumulated a massive wealth, but then he's committing in his own words human rights violations by deplatforming millions of people. Jack Dorsey has said that in his own words, he said that having access to the internet is a human right. He mm -hmm. said social media access is a human right. So if you, as a leader of a tech company, are deciding to ban uh, the leader of the free world and you know millions of his supporters or you know just people in general for constitutionally protected speech, you are guilty of human rights violations. I don't. Uh, I don't envy the position that Jack's in. I, you know, I'm a. You know, we'll say to you now, I'm a big supporter of his. Um, because I love everything he's doing to support Bitcoin um, and promote Bitcoin. Uh, right, but at the end of the day, if you're really supporting something and you're promoting something, don't you want to have representatives and advocates who are actually uh, true and principled in their values? I mean, the well, whole the whole thing that drew me to Bitcoin is somebody who is deplatformed. And trust me, I, I would be homeless if it wasn't for Bitcoin. I paid my bills at a time when I had no income coming in. When I was banned on PayPal and I lost 90% of my, my income as an activist and an independent journalist, I survived and paid my bills on Bitcoin. And well, so how... How do you how do you position somebody like Jack Dorsey, who I call the king of censorship, as a Bitcoin advocate when he's destroying people's lives? Well, there's there's some nuance and complexity that I think we should work through because Bitcoin itself is very different from Bitcoin isn't a company. Bitcoin is a decentralized right. protocol. Right. And which, the whole point of decentralization, right, is that mm -hmm. no one person controls it. 
and, and it's supposed to be censorship resistant. Yes, but contrary to big tech well, terms of service. Let's let's work through that. I, I I can't even pretend to understand or know what it's like to run Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever. And I am critical of some of their decisions, but there are some things related to specifically, let's say Twitter, where it feels like people think tagging at Jack becomes a customer service line. And I have no idea what it's like for him to go into his mentions and into his notifications and see all these thousands, millions of complaints saying Jack sort this out, Jack sort that out. I don't know the decision making within Twitter, how much influence he has. I don't know how much shareholding he has now. I don't know how the team makes decisions there. It might be that certain things are are out of his hands, but I do think he sympathizes with you. I mean, he's, what is it he says here? I love activists. I respect Laura's desire to make Twitter better. I would not chain myself to a corporate office, but I respect that courage. I mean, I think that's a, a nice thing to say. And when you were trying to talk to him on stage, you know, he was you know, responding to you and he said he's interested in these topics. And I actually think... He should it, take a meeting with me then. Well, maybe. Um, maybe he will, maybe he won't. But... The point is, I, I think I think he is wrestling with these uh, difficulties around censorship and banning of accounts. My assumption, and I hate to make assumptions on other people's behalves, are uh, I think he's wrestling with the idea that this is a platform he's part of and he helped create and now is essentially the, the figure point for, but at the same time, he knows there's a lot of good that can come from social media and it's bad that can come from it. And I think mm -hmm. he wrestles with the bad because I actually believe... He wants to create a better world and he wants to help other people. And I think he's possibly wrestling with the difficulty of that. Perhaps harm can be done, like some speech can lead to harm. It, you know, the incitement of violence, for et cetera. So right, I, but what was, what was the incitement of violence? There, Donald Trump never incited any violence. He never incited violence. Yeah. He never incited violence. He gave a rally. And as the leader of the free world and the president of the United States, you know, the Constitution protects the right to peacefully assemble. And express your grievances. And and you know what? I'll tell you right now that... Uh, it wasn't a peaceful I know, assembly, though. It was a peaceful assembly. Hmm. There's a lot of information coming out now. There are a lot of reports that these were FBI informants who who staged the January 6th uh, break-in into the Capitol. And I know that, you know, maybe you want to snicker at that and people no, will I'm not snicker. Snickering. No, but, it's more But like... the mainstream media doesn't report this. And this is the problem that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You have people living in their own echo chambers, which is why our world has become so incredibly polarized. And I blame people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg who have completely excluded the conservative talking point. They have completely excluded the conservative talking yeah. point. So I'm going to disagree with you there. I don't think they've excluded the conservative talking point. You, you can very easily go on to Twitter and Facebook and see the conservative talking point. I'm very aware of the conservative talking points. I'm sympathetic to some and I'm sympathetic to people on, on the left they, as well. They banned the leader of the Republican Party. Yes, but they didn't close down the conservative talking point. They banned one user. It doesn't mean you still don't know the views of conservatives or the opinions of conservatives. They haven't closed it down. No, you get banned. You get banned. There's algorithms on Twitter that ban you if you say Trump won. If you talk about election integrity or you say the election was stolen, right, you get banned. You, if you, if you, if you, let's not even talk about politics, right? Let's talk about COVID. Well, if yeah. you talk about taking ivermectin, uh, like Joe Rogan did, or you, t or I took ivermectin, I had COVID a few weeks ago. You talk about um, HCQ, or you say you don't want to take the vaccine because people are dying, which is true. You get banned. They're, they're, they're banning people for for simply having open discussions. Yeah. This is wrong. And a lot of that troubles me as well. Um, as I said earlier, when Brett Weinstein was removed from YouTube for discussing ivermectin, that troubled me. And uh, it does trouble me with people being banned for uh, opinions with relation to COVID because that's definitely been a, a moving picture in terms of what the understanding is of the effectiveness and the potential downsides to taking a vaccine. I mean, I'm vaccinated and I, I still firmly believe it's uh, the right thing for me to do at my age and my children aren't. I think it's firmly right for those. But these, this is where I think it gets a bit difficult. It's where we go from the area of protecting, uh, trying to protect people from inciting violence to becoming authorities on what truth is and the fact check inside of things. And I think that's where it becomes particularly tricky. And I, I am troubled by that. But I actually, I, where I see Dorsey different from Zuckerberg, I think, I think Jack wrestles with these things. I, I really believe that these are things he's concerned with. And I, I would want to ask him, 
what he thinks, you know, what's his approach? What, how does he feel about this? But my feeling is he's somebody who does want a better society and he wrestles with this, but who knows? Well, I see that Jack Dorsey, you know, they say that even a broken clock is right twice a day. And so I saw recently that Jack Dorsey announced, uh, you know, when he was talking about Bitcoin, that he is working to build a completely decentralized, uh, you know, social media network. Mm -hmm. But look, I, I love the idea. You know, it's something that, uh, you know, I think would be good to have a fully decentralized social media company. But, you know, how can you how can you have a decentralized social media company, right, as the head of Twitter and Cash App, right, when you're banning people? I mean, it just it, it, it doesn't seem like he can really separate separate the two. And for me, that's that's a very hypocritical thing. You have to live, in, in my opinion, you have to live and, and not just preach the message that you believe in, but you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Right? What? And that's yeah. what I do, right? What, what happened when you went up to his house? Explain what happened there. <laughs> but, but going on with what I said before I get into that, you, you have to walk the walk along with the talk, right? So the talk, it's great, right? Of course, of course, a decentralized social media network could be great, but what is he actually doing in his personal and professional life to prove that he is serious, right? Well, I, I mean, he's investing personal and company money into right. supporting but Bitcoin. But this goes back to the concept of decentralization. Mm -hmm. How can you be, right, the head of Twitter and how can you ban people on Cash App? How can you continue to ban people on Twitter and not issue any public statements about it? If, if Jack Dorsey really is wrestling with these ideas, right, maybe he should issue a statement about it. Well, he's given interviews regarding that. I mean, I, I watched a couple recently. I, I have never seen Jack Dorsey come out and, and apologize for completely polarizing our nation, okay, by banning the leader of the free world and shutting down discourse. I've never seen Jack Dorsey apologize for interfering in our elections. These are crimes. Election interference is a crime. He interfered not only in the presidential election, but he also interfered in my campaign. And I want to know how they justify having a policy prior to me running for office that said that all candidates, congressional and gubernatorial in the United States of America, can have access to Twitter. And then when I filed to run for office, they completely changed their policy and say all candidates besides Laura Loomer. Did you know I was the only candidate in the United States of America who ran for federal office last election cycle who had no Twitter, no Instagram, and no Facebook? He had Gab, right? I had Gab and Parler. Parler. Parler was yep. great. You know, I had 1.6 million followers on Parler. And then look what happened to Parler. Parler was deplatformed, viciously deplatformed. I thought that was very strange as well. Yeah, Why viciously deplatformed in an orchestrated, orchestrated takedown between the FBI, okay, Democrat politicians, and, and companies like Amazon. It See, was awful. Yeah, this is where it's tricky because, um, like I say, I, I agree with you on some of these points. Um, and I think you articulate yourself very well. And then I come back and think, well, why is it that you seem to have this quite controversial, polarizing uh, persona? Because it, it really, honestly, this is how destructive, this is how destructive social media is. Jack Dorsey doesn't understand how destructive he has been. Jack Dorsey has, has really brought a lot of trauma to my life. He really has, and I don't think he understands how he is personally responsible for ruining people's lives and defaming them and destroying their reputations. How's, how's he defamed you? Here's he seems example. pretty nice here. So, just so, you know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, Laura Loomer's a white supremacist. They don't know, I'm, I'm Jewish, okay? I'm, I, am, I am a Jewish woman. I know that. And I was banned from Twitter for posting a tweet in which I called Ilhan Omar anti-Jewish. Well, on November 15th, 2017. It was, hold on, we should, it was a little more. You no, said I, said, more. I said she was anti-Jewish and pro-Sharia, which I stand by. What was the actual tweet? Do you remember? I sent it to you, but ah. it said, it said, it's ironic how the Twitter moment of the day is a, is a picture of Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar is, um, is, is anti-Jewish and Ilhan Omar is pro-Sharia. Under Sharia, women are oppressed and homosexuals are killed. Completely factual tweet. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong about that. Did they right? give you a reason for that tweet? They said it was hate speech. She's an elected official. You should be able to criticize your elected officials. But going back to how Jack Dorsey defamed me, right? In uh, November, they, I used to have a verified Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And um, when I had my verified Twitter account, right, this was because, you know, you, the whole purpose of having a verified account is so that if you're a public figure, 
you can tell people who you are, mm -hmm. right? Without having imposters, because if you're a public figure, the worst thing you could have is somebody posting something and then having it go viral and the media report on it and it turns out it's just a fake parody account, right? Mm -hmm. So then Jack Dorsey decides um, after this Unite the Right Charlottesville rally that he's going to strip people of their verification. And he decides to strip people like uh, Richard Spencer, Jason Kessler, the organizers of the Unite the Right rally of their, of their verification marks. And then he just threw me and Tommy Robinson into the mix. I wasn't even at the Unite the Right rally, okay? And then on the, the Twitter banner, you know how Twitter has that banner mm -hmm. where they show news headlines? The Twitter banner was prominent white supremacists are stripped of their, ver of their verification mark. And guess whose photo they used? Yeah. Well, Tommy Robinson is a piece of shit. So but am, like, I, am, am I a white supremacist? Him. Uh, how do you how do you call a Jewish woman a white supremacist? I don't believe you're a white supremacist. Right, and I, it took it took thirty seconds for my Wikipedia page to be updated with that photo and that Twitter banner. And to this day, if you go, it still says she had her Twitter verification removed because she's a white supremacist, and that's Jack Dorsey's yeah, fault. Yeah, so I don't see you're a white supremacist, but I see sometimes how you say controversial things that may lead people to say that. Well, you know. <laughs> Controversial things are still protected by the First Amendment. Of course, but I'm just, I'm talking about why I think it may end up with people thinking that. Right. You know, it's like you hold these firm opinions of Jack Dorsey, which I right. disagree with. I see him differently. And well, you asked me how he defamed me, and I told you that's how he defamed me. Never apologized for it, you know, but when you are branded as a white supremacist, and that's what Wikipedia says, and then there's a million articles that print you're a white supremacist, and they forever cite that she had her Twitter verification removed for being a white supremacist, I mean, that is very destructive to your life. It's destructive to your business. And he did that to me. He did that to me four years ago. Do you not hold any... When I was 24 years old. Do you not hold any personal responsibility for some of the opinions people hold of you? Maybe your approach to things? No, or some look, of the things he, I, I, I take responsibility for my own actions, but... That doesn't mean I'm a white supremacist or doesn't mean that I, you know, they, they always say that I hate Muslims, right? But if they were to actually look at my investigations and look at my work and it's look at my Islam, activism, right? I'm a critic of Islam. Yes. I don't hate Muslims. You know, I had Muslims who worked on my congressional campaign last election cycle. There was actually a Muslims for Loomer coalition, right? But because I have this aggressive approach where I confront people head on with my camera, right? It was called Loomering. They, mm -hmm. they said that I was anti-Muslim. Right, and then they they constantly extrapolate scenarios from my life and my career, right? Particularly some incidents that happened with Uber to falsely accuse me of being racist or anti-Muslim. I'm not anti-Muslim. I'm anti-Sharia. I'm anti-Islam. Well, I'm going, only going to quote you here, one of your tweets, because we're going to get into the Uber yeah, lift thing. <laughs> I'm late to the NYPD press conference because I couldn't find a non-Muslim cab or Uber, Lyft driver for over 30 minutes. This is insanity. So I think that's racist. Well, how is it racist? I, because I think you're discriminating against Muslims. Well, Islam's not a race, so how is it racist? Uh, okay. okay. No, but seriously, these are, these are, these are, it's, it's not just an issue of semantics, right? When you label somebody as a racist, okay, you, you, are, you are saying that they are a hateful person or intolerant of a specific okay. race. I think and that's what people need to understand is that, is that if you're going to make an accusation against someone, you better understand the terminology that you're using. You better understand the difference between race and political ideology, race and religion, right? Yeah, if I said nasty things about black people or Hispanic people, right? Okay, maybe, maybe that term could be applied, but Islam is not a race. Okay, so we have a term for people who are anti-Jewish, which is anti-Semitic. Right, but but so being what, Jewish is classified as a race. It actually has been classified okay. as a race. What do we have as a term for someone who is anti-Muslim, anti-Muslim people? Are, are we saying you are you are religiously discriminated against people? They call them Islamophobic, but there's no such thing as Islamophobia because when you look at when you look, and this is the thing they call me. They always say proud Islamophobe Laura Loomer. Well, I challenge them on that, right? I challenge them, and and you know I always have facts to back up back up my statements, right? And that's the difference mm -hmm. between me that's and fine. my accusers is they don't have facts and they don't understand. They haven't extensively studied the Quran like I have. They haven't extensively studied the ramifications and the social and political and, and uh, you know, uh, 
economic effects that Islamic immigration is having on Western civilization throughout the world. I mean, it's having tremendous effects in your homeland of, of the UK, right? How? Indisputable. How is it? You're, yeah. Well, for, for starters, right? You know, you have an importation of Islamic immigrants in the UK and all parts of all parts of Europe, really. But we're experiencing this here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. You have now no-go zones. You have no-go zones in places. Where? Tell me a no-go zone in the UK. You have no-go zones in London. And your 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 mayor, I your mayor Sadiq Khan, right? Sadiq Khan himself, right, has has issued orders to police officers to not go into some of these neighborhoods where they have their own Muslim police. No, t tell me where there's a no-go zone. Well, you, I think that the best the best person to talk about this, who I think you should have on your show to talk about this, is Tommy Robinson, who himself has actually been sentenced to jail in the UK for exposing these Islamic no-go zones. Well, ho and this ho isn't ho an interview. Up. This isn't an interview about no-go zones. But to answer your question, right? Yeah. The phobia. They but say, hold on, hold on. If we're going to jump around. You, you talk a lot. I have to. I have to have my uh, place to say. You say you back up with facts, right? And you said there's no go zones in the UK. You can't name me one because there aren't. The only no go zones in the UK I wouldn't go to are areas of London which are controlled by gangs which are stabbing people. Right, and I those are pa a lot of them are oh. Pakistani gangs. No, they are Pakistani gangs and rape gangs. Yes, no. Again, you're confusing London with what was happening in the north of England. I think it was in Rotherham. I think it was Rotherham. I'd have to fact check that. That's a different situation. Let's let's work through these. The only no go zones I know in the UK that I have are certain areas in London where which are run by the drug. But let me finish the drug gangs. If you if you're going to say there's no go zones, tell me. I'll go there with a camera and show there, you. On there. The fact of the matter is is that places in Europe have been fundamentally transformed by immigration. Hold, hold on, hold on. You, you have had. Laura, you're let me just around. give you a couple instances. Laura, Laura, we've got to be fair here. I'm, yeah, if I, we're we're fair. I'm just saying, you if you. If you know of no-go zones, uh, areas which are uh, uh, predominantly Muslim areas that you think are no-go no, no zones, tell me. I'll go because they don't right. exist. That's, that's, well, that's not well, a fact. We, we can talk about this, but my point hold about on, hold Islamophobia. On. I've, I've, just got to, I've just got to carry on. You also said that Tommy Robinson was sent, sentenced to jail for exposing the – what was what do you think he was sent he to was, jail for? He was sent to jail for – uh, for for exposing these rape gangs, these Islamic rape gangs. Yeah, so what, what it is, there are specific laws in the UK with not revealing certain information with regards to people who are accused of crimes during trial because if you do that, that can actually, uh, that can actually break the trial and it can actually uh, uh, lead to the prosecution not being achieved. Those laws exist for a reason to ensure that you can get the prosecution. What he did is it broke those laws. It was fucking stupid and morally irresponsible, uh, irresponsible. And he has very little backing for that. That's not to say that people don't look at these gangs and say, God, these gangs are disgusting and terrible. But yeah, they're we, raping They're raping small course. small girls and children and, well, and killing people in the yeah, UK. Yeah. It's horrendous. And this is a direct result well, of the immigration. Well, Again, we're gonna to have to we're, we're gonna to have to start keeping to to, to topic at a time. These gangs, uh, I'm pretty sure it's up in Rotherham and some other places. They were targeting young girls, you know, teenage girls. Yeah. They were plying them with drugs and alcohol, and they were mm -hmm. sharing them around. I don't know of a single murder within those gangs. Uh, you said they were uh, uh, raping and killing them. I know they were supplying with drugs. I'm not sure they were killing them. But but the police, the prosecution service, want to ensure a prosecution of these people. Tommy Robertson did things which could affect the prosecution. That's why he was arrested and went to jail. He broke the law. Those laws exist for a reason. And I think he was in the wrong. But that doesn't mean I don't agree with him that at some point these people need to expose him. But yeah. the law exists for a reason. So Tommy's in well, the wrong Well, you way. know, we can agree to disagree on, on certain matters. But going back to what you well, said. Well, what, what are we agreeing to dis disagree with? Well, here? you know, look, I don't really think... Think that I don't really think that people who come into the country and some of them look. I don't know every single instance of every single gang member, but mm -hmm. I do know that some of these people, just like there, there are many of them who are here illegally in the United States. Many are are there illegally in the UK as well. And I don't really think that those people who are guilty of crimes like raping, gang banging, gang gang raping young girls, right, passing them around destroying their lives. I don't think that they're really worthy of, of humanity. I don't really yeah, but think what, that- what, what do we disagree? You said we have to agree to disagree. I don't think that Tommy Robinson's tactics are wrong. But, I think this needs to be exposed. And so, if the media so, is going to okay. be putting gag orders on this in the UK like they have and not reporting the names, and then this is another thing they did in the UK too, where they, they reported the, um, the rapists as Asian. That's not fair. That's not right. There's a there's a big difference between an Islamic immigrant from Pakistan and then calling somebody Asian. There's a big difference between between you know Islamic and Asian. But what what if the prosecution failed because of Tommy's actions? Would you still support his actions? 
How would it have failed? Because the, because there are, I mean, I don't know. All he was doing was simply letting the people know who these people were. Yeah, but the reason they exist and the gag order exists is to, to, to try and ensure you get the prosecution. And that, you know, that's as far as I know about this. So, I, I mean, well, if I didn't know, I would have a fact It's a very strange way for gag orders because the way gag orders work here in the United States, right, is that the jury isn't allowed to speak to the media. But I find it to be rather, rather strange that a gag order would prevent would prevent the press or anybody from even just reporting the names of people who actually were guilty of crimes. All right? I'm saying is that, that law exists for a reason. Right. I don't know the answer now. I would right. double check it, but but he that that is a, a law we have that exists and he well, and he broke that. Also, I think I think a lot of the I'm almost certain most of the people in Rotherham who were arrested were people who were uh, natively born in the UK. I'm not talking about every single case. Yeah. I'm not just talking about that case in in particular. There are lots of cases, and you know we can we can go through them, but that's not the purpose of this podcast, right? Well, no, I'm, I mean, I'm simply talking about how you know if you if you speak out about these issues, if you have an opinion about it, or you post a story about it, if you are not if you are not perpetuating violence or advocating for violence, why is there so much hostility towards people having an open discussion and a debate? No one's getting hurt, right? We're having no. a discussion. You disagree with some things I'm saying. Why is there this need to constantly shut down and censor and silence and gag, you know, uh, opposing viewpoints, specifically around this topic, right? Just because you have a, a different opinion doesn't mean you get to call, you know, the person who you're opposing a racist or, you know, a Nazi or a white supremacist or an Islamophobe. Right. And that's, you know, unfortunately what they do. And they work with these leftist organizations mm -hmm. like the ADL and the SPLC. And I think in the UK, your version of the SPLC is called what? Hope, not hate or something like that. Yeah. So here right. we go. I think this is useful to get up. So Tommy Robinson could have caused Huddersfield grooming trials to collapse and child rapists to go free. If jurors get to know of this video, I would no doubt be faced with an application to discharge the jury, judge said before jailing Robinson in May. Okay, so we should we should have this. Grooming trials that saw the largest gang ever convicted for years of sexual abuse were almost derailed by Thomas Robertson as he claimed to expose the crimes. A judge paused jury deliberations in the second half of three linked trials over fears that the far-right figurehead's live stream of the case from outside Lee's Crown Court could result in the case collapsing and the rapists going free. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have watched Robinson, whose real name is Stephen Yaxley Lennon, which is always, I always thought was funny, talk f uh, for more than an hour about Muslims and jihadi rape gangs on the 25th of May. Yada, yada. Uh, let me just try and find the actual. Okay. The video violated the blanket reporting restrictions imposed by Judge Jeffrey Marston QC in March to prevent defendants claiming jurors had been prejudiced against them by reading about previous trials. So that exists. The, the judge put a gag in order because he didn't want to prejudice on the trial. And this is a judge trying to uh, uh, support the prosecution. Well, he, I mean, he's trying to get to a fair, whatever the decision should be. But like Tommy Robinson could have derailed the prosecution. So that's why it exists. It, it, these, the, we can dis agree or disagree with the law, but he broke the law and he could have derailed the prosecution. So he could have actually um, kind of done the opposite of what he was trying to achieve, which is uh, essentially leads, lead to these people going free. So I think it's important with these things like... We have to know why these laws exist, and you know they, the case law will be there to to you know to protect the trials to ensure that you can achieve a prosecution and not derail these cases. So, I mean, I wouldn't talk to Tommy Robinson because I I think he's a dick, but I'm happy to talk to you about this. Yeah, well, look, I mean, but, you know, but this also, isn't an interview about Tommy Robinson, but you know, I know Tommy Robinson; he's a friend of mine, and uh, I don't think that he's been treated fairly. I don't think that it was right that you know when he ran for office in the UK, his campaign, similarly to mine, was also censored, and he was not allowed to have access to social media. I mean, these are these are issues. Regardless of whether I think we need to get past a point of regardless of whether or not you like a person, just like you're talking about the laws in the UK, right? Our mm -hmm. laws may be different here in the United States, but. Um, you know, you are also entitled, right, here in the United States of America to be able to campaign and run for office, right? You are entitled to run your election freely. And I think that the um, the same should have also been afforded to Tommy Robinson when he was uh, running for office uh, in the UK as well. But, you know, whether it's here in the United States or in the UK or wherever, right, these are issues that are impacting millions, really billions, I would say billions of people all around the world, mm -hmm. right? I think every single citizen of the world was subjected pretty much to the COVID lockdowns and, uh, you know, the mask mandates and, uh, you know, really the ramifications of being locked down. And if, uh, you know, we are now seeing 
whether it's running for office or simply being an investigative reporter or an activist or, uh, you know, a podcaster like yourself, having access to these different sites and being able to openly uh, communicate and spread information is, is, is critical. And there's only a select group of people who are controlling all of that. And that's, that's my, that's my problem. Well, I'm, you know, you are right. I would worry about losing my YouTube channel. I would worry about losing my Twitter account because they're part of my business. Um, and I don't, I'm not fully clear on why right. I might, what are the reasons I could, but uh, at the same time, I, I would reiterate the point that, you know, if you're going to come out and say things like there are no go zones in the UK, which by the way there aren't, it's it's false. Then you are dis, you are also disseminate, I don't disseminate know. I'll, misinformation. I'll have to talk to my friend Raheem Kassam, who's also a fellow uh, a fellow Brit, and have him send you his book. He wrote a Please. book called No Go Zones about these no go zones. Tell in me the where there are, and I will go there. All right, <laughs> and I'll, I'll I'll take a photo right. of you from there. Sounds good. So so let's let's go back a step because we do have this uh, uh, term for people who discriminate against Jewish people and it's you know it's seen as largely abhorrent and at <laughs> yeah. the same time I feel like you are discriminating against a group of people M Muslims uh, I felt like that that Uber Lyft tweet you're discriminating against all Muslims well I was making a political point I was making a statement and I talk about that in my well, book what extensively. is the statement like what's to achieve because if so you, the reason I, there's I, context I, associated let with me, that let me sorry just let me explain why I want to ask the question is that you're running for office yeah and I believe the role of somebody who runs for office is to work for their constituents whether they right. voted for them or whether they didn't and you also talked earlier about uh Stoke and division and that you believe Jack Dorsey is Stoke and division but I don't see how you can't see this is Stoke and Division. And <laughs> well, that, there's and context. No one ever wants to talk about the context behind that tweet. See, we're in New York City right now, and uh, a couple of years ago on Halloween, we're actually coming up on the anniversary. Is your birthday Halloween? My birthday's Halloween. Oh, hello, happy, happy birthday. Sunday. Wow. Yeah, got a little pumpkin here. Well, happy birthday. Okay, you're so, on Halloween. So um, you can take that book as a present. I even signed there it for you. There you go, thank you. <laughs> don't say I never did anything for you. So it was 2017. It was Halloween, so that's what, four years ago now? Mm -hmm. And um, if you recall, I don't know if you remember the story, but uh, there was an Islamic terrorist attack in Manhattan, and um, a Muslim man who was working for Uber mm -hmm. and happened to be an Islamic um, immigrant, he took a truck, and uh, he was an Uber driver, mm -hmm. and he rammed the truck into um, the bike lane, and he killed eight people, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, then he got out of his car, and he started chanting, Allahu Akbar. Okay, pledged allegiance to ISIS. He mm -hmm. was working for Uber. Okay. Okay. So when this happened, the media was just completely, you know, obfuscating the fact that this guy was an Uber driver. I mean, you have an ISIS terrorist working as an Uber driver in New York City. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And so I was, you know, raising awareness about this on my Twitter and I was tweeting about it. And I was wondering, I was like, why is Uber not doing anything about this? Because this isn't the first time that this has happened. There's actually a, a documented history of Uber drivers who are ISIS terrorists or Islamic terrorists using cars and acts of vehicular jihad to kill people. It actually happened in the UK, if you recall, there was an Uber driver uh, who uh, rammed his car into Buckingham Palace and he said that he was on a mission to kill the Queen of England. Okay. So maybe you have seen is that. that, is that the, I think he got out and he stabbed the policeman as well. Yeah, talk about it. It's all I, yeah. in my book, right? There was another instance where a Somali war criminal who had like, burned people alive and you know, tortured people and was working as a war general to, you know, to kill people in the name of Islam. He was an Uber driver in, I believe it was Virginia. I talk about this all in my book. So, you know, at, at some point you have to wonder why is there, you know, why is there such um, a problem at Uber with these Islamic terrorists driving for them? And so I wanted to make a point and I said to myself, wow, you know, let me, let me try ordering an Uber. Let me try ordering a Lyft. Well, every single time I tried ordering an Uber or a Lyft, it would be like Muhammad Abdul, you know, same with the taxi drivers. And because I had a hundred thousand followers on my Twitter account at the time, and I wanted to create discussion around Uber's, uh, safety protocols to ensure that, you know, nobody else was ever murdered again by an Islamic terrorist Uber driver. I said, all right, I'm going to tweet something really provocative. And I'm going to tweet that I'm late for the press conference because I couldn't find a non-Islamic Uber Lyft or cab driver. I said it. How do you know Mohammed isn't Christian? Well, the guy had a prayer rug on the No, on the but I'm saying which, you um, said you looked at their names. You yeah. said it's all Ma How do you know Mohammed's not a Christian? Well, you know, you could you could you could argue, I guess, that maybe, you know, I was insinuating, but Mohammed is the number one most popular 
um, you know, name in the Islamic uh, Islamic community. And I believe in the UK, they just, there was a report that came out last year that said that uh, Muhammad is actually the uh, number one most popular baby name in the UK now, thanks to Islamic immigration. So- But, but I live there, it doesn't bother me. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying it has to bother you. These are just facts, right? We're talking about facts. And so, you know, why should I, as a Jewish woman, you know, there was a study conducted by an Islamic expert by the name of Dr. Bill Warner, and he actually did a side-by-side -side comparison of the Quran and Hitler's Mein Kampf, okay? Hitler's Mein Kampf manifesto written to inspire, you know, the genocide of Jews during the Holocaust, and then the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam. He actually found mathematically that there was more Jew hatred in the Quran than Hitler's Mein Kampf. So why, as a Jewish woman, should I have to subjugate myself uh, to that? And why, uh, when, you know, in the tenets of Islam, women are viewed as property, you know, Jews and Christians are called kafirs and, you know, uh, are, are, are often enslaved and killed, right? Like the, like the prophet Muhammad encouraged them to do. Why should I feel safe as a Jewish woman who is outspoken, about radical Islam, getting in an Uber or a Lyft or a cab driver when there's clearly no vetting process taking place. Mm -hmm. I think that my safety matters. Yeah, so, I mean, it would helpful, be helpful if I had a, uh, a, a scholar here to uh, respond to some of your points and some of the points you're making, because I can't answer them. We, I, it's, yeah. it's not something I can agree, approve, or disprove yeah. in a scenario like well, this. Well, they can go look it up. It's Dr. Well, Bill Warner. He's, you know, very, he's world-renowned. Uh, is a scholar on Islam, mm -hmm. and and he has done this comparison. And so I just want to know why why should I, as a Jewish woman, have to uh, you know potentially endanger my life when you know I had the unfortunate experience of seeing bodies splattered all over all over the streets of Manhattan because an Uber driver who was also an ISIS terrorist killed eight people. But isn't this about vetting? rather than discrimination. And that but that's what I said to you is I I knew that my tweet was going to go viral and that people were going to have a field day with it so I intentionally tweeted it. I intentionally but it's a bit of a crass incited way to do provocation. It. Yeah, but because a, that's my whole style, right? I ins I I often make a scene to make a point. That's what the whole Lumard brand is about, mm -hmm. is making a scene to make a point or being provocative to make a point. So obviously it's a very provocative and charged statement. I knew that when I tweeted it. That's you, why I but, tweeted it. But do you ever think it it doesn't have the effect that you really want. It's ultimately self-destructive. Perhaps. Like what? Is, I mean, what, what, perhaps. Is it you, what is it you? What is it you're trying to do, Laura? What is it you're trying to achieve? Like, I could say I'm trying to build a podcast, spread the knowledge of Bitcoin. That's why. And my goal is to financial freedom. The more people have financial freedom, the better. Have access to Bitcoin and can improve their lives. And I think that is a you know progressive idea to try and help people live a better life what, what is it you're trying like i so that's it what depends. i can't figure prior, out prior prior it, it, it's changed prior to uh being banned and my mission has changed since being banned so what is your mission now well now my mission is to expose big tech tyranny and to you know hold the big tech social media giants accountable for you know election interference and silencing conservatives and to you know get elected to office so that what has happened to me never happens to another American citizen ever again. No okay. American citizen should ever be completely deplatformed and silenced and stripped of their ability to communicate. No American citizen should just be banned and prevented from banking. They shouldn't be banned from you know being able to use payment processors just because of their political viewpoints. I agree. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be targeted and banned from being able to own a gun like I was. And so, you know, just like you're on a mission to make people's lives better, I'm on a mission to make people's lives better. I'm on a mission to make tech better. You know, in the words of Jack Dorsey himself, he says he even admires my what does it say? My desire to make Twitter better. Didn't he make you a cup of coffee when? No, when he didn't make out? me anything. He was, was he was even... overseas. I think he was on vacation in Myanmar uh -huh. when I handcuffed myself. Um, Oh, so, I think I cut you off when you asked me about yeah, so, what I was doing well, in this house. I'll have to tell you about that. Yeah, we'll come back too. to that. But like, so what is it you want Uber to do and Lyft to do? Because for me, this would be that they should be vetting. I wanted them to be vetting. And oh. so I, 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 I created Laura, a policy campaign. You sometimes have to let me speak. I agree that there should be vetting, but also some people are going to be tricky and they're going to get through the vetting. And so obviously there is a role here for 
I assume the FBI to be supporting this vetting as well. Um, uh, because we have we have terrorist attacks in the UK as well. We have people who slip through the system, and it's it happens, and it's it's sad because awful things happen. We've had awful terrorist attacks in the UK. We we mm-hmm. had the bombing mm-hmm. at an Ariana Grande concert. We've had multiple stabbings through London. We had the uh, July I think it was July, July the seventh uh, terrorist attacks. So it happens. But and who was you, responsible for those attacks? Ultimately, the person who pulls no, the trigger. No, who, who was it? Was it Jews? Uh, Was it Christians? Ultimately, for, well, I mean, if you want to do that, we can go through the history of violence. No, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm trying, I, you asked I me mean, what my purpose is. I'm trying to. Who's, who's responsible for the 1.5 million killed in Iraq? George Bush. He's a Christian. Well, I'm I not, I don't, like, look, I'm uh, so, no supporter of George well, W. Bush. I'm just saying, like, if you want to, you want to get into that, that my problem is religion, like just religion. I I think any form of religion is is uh, usually believing some kind of made up nonsense. Sorry, if, sorry if anyone's listening is offended. I'm offended. I'm just not a religious person, and uh, I think it's very easy to point fingers and and blame acts on di- different religions. You can you can point to you know it, it's like a really good example. If you try and talk about uh, Israel and Palestine, you never get anywhere because everyone thinks everyone else is uh, to blame, and they blame the, the other's religion. Yeah. You, you know, Christians have killed a lot of people in the world. Muslims, like pe- a lot of people have died at the hands of religion, full stop. I'm saying with regards to uh, Lyft and Uber, what is it you want them to do? Do you want them to vet? And what should they be vetting on? Or do you think there should be a filter within there that says, I don't want to have any uh, drivers who are Muslim? I think that they need to be vetting. I had okay. no problem. I had no problem with, uh, you know, getting in Ubers with uh, with Muslim drivers uh, prior to this. You know, I simply was making a political uh, statement, a provocative statement to uh, generate news coverage, to encourage Uber and Lyft to, uh, you know, improve their, their vetting processes because no one was talking about it. And I thought that more people deserve to know that this guy was an Uber driver because how many how many people are you know being raped by their Uber drivers? How many people are being killed by their Islamic Uber drivers? And I document this all in my book. Look, you know, you talk about facts, of course. It's it's I cite it. There's footnotes in the mm-hmm. book to these stories, and you can see these instances. These are real life scenarios. There was, would, a, do there was a there was a a woman a, a woman from the UK named Rebecca Dykes. She was murdered by an Islamic uh, Uber driver. He was she was raped and killed by an Islamic Uber driver because he didn't like the fact that her skirt was so short in the back of his car. Mm-hmm. You know, these are real things that are happening. And mm-hmm. so I don't think that it's hateful to bring uh, you know this to people's attention. Uh, I, I think, think that your I think tactics are wrong, and that's where people. You know, I, I think have, ultimately you you're going to push people. Like I think you could achieve more by taking a different approach. I think the approach of saying, I'm late to the NYPD press conference because I couldn't find a non-Muslim cab driver, you might think, oh, this is great because I get a, uh, you know, it's provocative and I'll get a lot of coverage. But I think people just go, I don't want to listen to what that person has to say. So for example, when this interview comes out, I'm doing it to respect the word, the, yeah. the word I gave you, but like I fundamentally disagree with your tactics. And I think you are stoking the same division which... You um, you accuse Jack Dorsey of so I think there's some hypocrisy there, but I think you make some good and interesting points. I think sometimes you just wrap them up in a in a bullshit way of doing it. Sorry. Well, and that's that's the issue is I think that you know people have to separate the person from the tactics and but they, they may not like my tactics, right? But you know at the end of the day, I I I I, I stand with the arguments I make. Um, I believe in what I say, and you know whether or not. Uh, they like or dislike my tactic. It doesn't dispute from the truth of the the situation at hand. Yeah, that's not that's not the point I was making. As uh, the point I was making to you is like, you could be it could be a net negative what you're doing, and 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 you're actually you're actually causing harm to what you're trying to achieve because, yeah, and and I Perhaps, do, I find but it could also be a net positive. I found I don't think so. I found that like pretty distasteful. Um, like there are other things like I like. I was trying to think, okay, why is it that people have such an issue with Laura? Like, what are the things that you've said? And i give you another one that was like, you know, not to just completely pick on you, but there was... Um, it's fine, I'm used to it. No, 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 because I'm <laughs> like, I've, I've got to be fair. I've got to... Yeah. yeah. Um, there, was a, there was another tweet with regards to uh, reference to 2,000 migrants drowning. Yeah, drowning. And, you, and your tweet was to clap and yeah. say, here's to 2,000 more. Yeah. Can you not see how that just is massively distasteful? Like people are trying to escape, you know, I've so I've been out to, I went out to, uh, before the lockdown, I went out to Turkey 
uh, to the border crisis at Greece to film what was happening, to meet the people and talk to them. But like, why are you here? People are leaving. Yeah, I went to Greece too. So people are leaving. And I spoke with Islamic uh, migrants when I was in Greece too, doing undercover work. So these people are leaving places. It could be everywhere from Eritrea to Afghanistan to Syria. People are leaving war. They're leaving for economic opportunity. And I, I'm not going to judge what every, good, uh, what every person's uh, agenda is, but mostly people just want to have a good life. And I think if, you, if you're if you putting yourself on in a dinghy and all the money you have and taking a baby just to try to get in a country to have a better life, like you're taking a big risk. And I think celeb- like clapping those deaths, that's, do you not see how that's distasteful? You know, could it, you know? I'll I'll give you one, right? I, right? When I look back over everything that I've done and everything that I've ever said, right? Do you was it that? was it distasteful? You know, it could have been you know a bit distasteful. But a bit. A, no, it was Come a bit on. distasteful. It was distasteful. It was distasteful. It was distasteful. But this is the point I'm trying to it make. It was distasteful. Like, I, I, I'll, I'll give you that one. But at the same time, right? I think there's a distortion. Between, you know, they talk about the migrant crisis. If you look at the people who are coming over on these dinghies in their boats, they're men. They're mostly men of fighting age. I, I don't really see women and babies on these rafts. Do you, I really well, okay. don't. So there's there's a mixed response to that because I've, I've met the people I've done it. There yeah, are, I've, got, I've done it too. And I was in Greece and I have okay. the undercover videos to prove it. And I'll show the, you the videos. And these migrants told me they were all men. There were no children. There were no women. And Do they you know said, why? we got illegal passports. And you know what they said? They said that they were going to use their passports, which they got for 3,000 euros, and illegally come to the United States and vote for Hillary Clinton. Okay. Got it on video. I mean- I, I don't know about that scenario. No, all it I is. can it's tell on you, video. all I can tell you is about what I did and the research I had. The reason is it isn't just men. There, there was women. There's pregnant women. There was children. Where I was, I can show you the footage. But it is predominantly men. The reason it's predominantly men is the men go first to try and establish a home, get work, and build a base to bring their family over. That's why the, it's usually the men who go first. It's very hard and expensive to move a whole family across Europe because you've got to walk across countries, get in buses, you've got to sleep under trees. It's unsanitary, it's difficult. So the men go first to try and build a home for their family and then bring their family across. So that's why it's predominantly men. That's that's the reason it happens. I don't... I mean, I know there's a massive border crisis here in the US and, and that's super tricky. I still understand why some people just want a better life. And that's maybe naive and people are like, oh, Pete, you're a fucking liberal in this case. But... You know, meeting people and them explaining, you know, what it's like for them. You know, meeting people in Syria who from, you know, the uh, the the war torn area of uh, Syria who like we've got to get out. If you know, there are people who face it face they face a situation where they could be bombed or they could be murdered, and they just want to get out and build a life for their family. So some of those people I understand. Now this isn't to say that bad eggs don't get through. This is to say that you know, <laughs> terrorist groups terrorist groups don't exploit this to put people into these countries. But I still think that's going to happen anyway. And I think the reason this is happening is because of the war that we've had. The, right, the but they're that, not entitled to come here. And we're entitled to go and bomb their countries? Look, I'm not I'm not saying that I agree with the, we with have the to war understand why. with George Bush's, you know, war on terror where he, you know, where he claimed that there were weapons of mass destruction that Which they never found in Iraq. There weren't. Okay? It was a lie. <laughs> he uh, himself and Tony Blair. And Colin Powell, who just died from COVID. Yeah, they should. Uh, you know? As you, I said, when Colin Powell died, I, I said, oh, man, Colin Powell just died. You know, he spent his whole career looking for weapons of mass destruction, and he only encountered it once he took the COVID vaccine. Yeah, see, that's another one. It's just like... But no, I mean, look, you, just because I'm a conservative and right wing doesn't mean that I support George Bush. You know, I think he's a, I think he's an absolute globalist shill. I don't support uh, people like Colin Powell, right? It doesn't mean that I support the Iraq war, right? Just because I'm, I'm but why, conservative. But why aren't you campaigning against George Bush? I mean, he led to way more deaths than any uh, terrorist group. I mean, 1.5 million died in Iraq alone. So why aren't you campaigning at his doors? Why am I not campaigning on... At George Bush's doors. You know, you're worried about, um, you know... Uh, you know, not just domestically, because you had concerns about the UK, somewhere you don't live and I do. You're worried about Islamic groups and your well, campaign. You know, perhaps perhaps Laura, I will go after on. George W. I'm just, Bush. I'm just saying, like, is it, wouldn't it be balanced to go, well, hold on, George Bush and Tony Blair led to the deaths of 1.5 million in Iraq. Why are you not campaigning against them? It feels like you have an like an anti-Islam agenda. And it's like, why haven't you got, a, a, like, why haven't you got an anti-religion agenda? Islam is, this is the thing that I find to be so interesting is that I have had such an extensive and successful 
career as an investigative reporter. And Islam is one aspect of it. And yet that has become my entire identity because of what Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg have decided to say about me online when they banned me and, you know, said, I disagree. found frivolous, uh, you know, said that calling an, an, a Muslim congresswoman anti-Jewish and pro-Sharia means that I'm guilty of hate speech. I mean, I have, I have done you know, tons of investigations. I was undercover as a, you know, reporter with Project Veritas for three years exposing voter fraud in the Hillary Clinton campaign. I have confronted people like Hillary Clinton on video. I have, I you know, that. done, I have confronted people like James Comey, okay? I take on the Republican establishment. I take on the Democrat establishment. Do you, do you know why I think it is? I think the reason being is some of these other things that you've done are quite interesting. I think the way you confronted Hillary Clinton was quite interesting. It was a book sign. It was quite interesting. I think the problem is, is this stuff stands out because it comes across at times as distasteful. No, this stuff stands out because people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg, you know, pick and choose, right? I, if yeah, you but wanna, I'm not if, picking and choosing. I was, not, I was not banned, though. This is the thing. I was not banned for those tweets that you read. Do you know that Jack Dorsey allowed me to stay on Twitter for about two years longer after you, I posted these You were these, warned these for posts. that day, though, No, you? I wasn't even warned for that tweet. Okay. I was not warned for that tweet. Okay. I was never sent a notification by Twitter telling me that that was a violation of their terms of service. Mm -hmm. I was I was banned from Twitter, okay? I received a warning for a tweet in which I called Linda Sarsour vile. They mm -hmm. said that that was their, that, that that was a violation. And then they banned me for calling Ilhan Omar anti-Jewish. Okay, that's fine. So if people tweet. think these tweets are so distasteful, go take it up with Jack Dorsey. That's not even what I was banned for. So there's all this distortion and these lies out on the internet about why I was actually banned and what I was banned for. Here we go. I've got it. Uh, isn't it ironic that how the Twitter moment used... Is it this one? Yeah, that's the tweet that isn't I it, told you about Isn't it ironic earlier. that the Twitter moment used to celebrate women, LGB, LGBTQ and minorities is a picture of... Uh, Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar. Ilhan Omar. Ilhan is pro Sharia. Ilhan is pro FGM, uh, female genital mutilation under Sharia. Homosexuals are oppressed and killed. Women are abused, forced to wear the hijab. Uh, Ilhan is anti Jewish. That was the tweet I was banned for. Yeah. And uh, it's all factual. Uh, okay. I mean, there'd be a lot to digest here, and I'd rather have somebody who understands uh, Islam as opposed to me. Um, because I. I think uh, homosexuals uh, are oppressed and uh, discriminated against under Islamic nations who yeah. take Sharia law as a basis for building. And that's what I said in my tweet. I said under Sharia, homosexuals are are oppressed and killed. They are. They hang them from cranes. Yeah. You know, and I'm a human rights. I'm a human rights advocate, and so you know, I don't like seeing gay people killed and hung from no, cranes. I don't think that Islam is right about gays and women. You know, so. So this is my whole purpose of confronting Jack Dorsey during the Alex Gladstein panel, which you intervened in. Yeah. You know, these are, these are human rights abuses, right? And yet Jack Dorsey has no problem amplifying the Taliban. You know, I talk about this in my book as well in a chapter called, I call it Silicon Sharia. He has no problem amplifying real life, um, you know, uh, perpetrators of human rights abuses, but then they want to, you know, pretend like conservatives are the real terrorists or conservatives are, you know, the most dangerous people on the internet. So it says here what you were banned for, specifically for violating our rules against hateful conduct, you may not promote violence against, threaten, harass other people on the basis of race, ethnicity, uh, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, religious affiliation, age, disability, or serious disease. So I don't think you got banned for specifically the words within this. I think you got banned for what was believed harassment against Ilhan. I'm not. She's I'm not an saying, elected official. I know. I'm just saying, like, you, it wasn't the only tweet you tweeted at her, right? No. I. I yeah. they, the reason they don't like me is because I exposed the fact that she married her brother, that which is now mainstream was, news. Was that and actually I, proved? I thought yes, it was proved. proven, and that even the Daily Mail. Right, even the Daily Mail. Hold on, uh, the Daily Mail is not something no, we but use there, as a source there, of truth has, in the UK. There was, there was <laughs> even, there was even a report that came out uh, two months ago about how they actually had DNA confirmation that this was her brother, and I broke the story, mm -hmm. and I was the first person to confront Ilhan Omar about it during um, one of her rallies before she was ever elected to Congress. Yeah. Right, and that was a big no-no because she, of course, now we see that she and the other members of the Hamas caucus, as I like to call them in our Congress, um, they. Um, they're untouchable. They can do no wrong, right? Mm. They can do no wrong. I mean, why do I get banned by Jack Dorsey for saying Ilhan's anti-Jewish when the Democrat Party literally had to draft a resolution to condemn Ilhan Omar 
because she was so anti-Semitic. I mean, I I don't know without talking to them, but I know you sent a lot of tweets. And I, my assumption is they maybe thought you were har- harassing her based on religion. You can't. You how if you're an elected official or you're a public figure, you subject yourself to to criticism. I mean, mm-hmm. my God, if I if I counted, what am I supposed to do? Go online and look at all the actual harassment tweets that are uh, lobbied against me? I mean, even you told me I've never seen somebody who's hated so much online by these people. I mean, you know, the the type of you want to talk harassment, you know? Please. Twitter has no problem with people harassing conservatives, right? But, but, oh, God forbid you talk about this congresswoman and expose the fact that she committed immigration fraud and marriage fraud and, you know, that she's a raging Jew hater. These are very complicated topics because it's one of those situations where I almost feel like I need uh, somebody f- like uh, Jamie uh, exists for Rogan to fact check and go through these things because there's a lot to digest here and there's a lot to go through and I'm going to have to research some of this and I'd love to know why they. It's just you. hypocrisy, you know. I, when I when I handcuffed myself to Twitter, I remember I I I actually printed out thousands of pages of tweets. If you recall, I brought my bag of tweets with me when I handcuffed myself. I, that's not the. I only heard about one part of that story. <laughs> With what, the handcuffing? Yeah, like they, had to come, like they didn't have to come and like clamp you out. Yeah, after four hours yeah. or so, yeah. Yeah, that's all yeah. I heard about. Yeah, because I had, I had um, ir- 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 well, I, I guess you could say I had special handcuffs made because I knew that with regular handcuffs you'd be able to just, snip you know, them. snip the chain. So I had my friend um, weld an actual like steel metal bar around the chain so that they wouldn't be able to. And then what I did is I took the key and I threw it down the drain, uh, the sewage drain in New York City on the side of the road next to Twitter. And then I filled the keyhole with a poxy, poxy glue so that if they tried to, you know, undo it, they wouldn't be able to. That must've been pretty uncomfortable. Did they they bring you any food? (laughs) No, but people wanted to order me pizzas. I mean, there were people, I guess, online on Twitter who were, you know, Oh, San Laura Loomer pizza. So they've never opened up like a, a, a dialogue with you to talk about why they banned you? And- no. No, they just banned me. They just banned me and said that I was hateful and Islamophobic. I, I, f- I feel like you do have uh, an anti-Islam uh, point of view. But, uh, but I already admitted this to you. I yeah. am anti-Islam. I'm not yeah. anti-Muslim. I'm anti-Islam yes. as the political ideology. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I feel terrible for because the, the biggest victims of Islam as the ideology itself are Muslims themselves, Muslim women, Muslim women. Uh, how many more people need to die before everyone agrees that Islam is a cancer and we should never let another Muslim into the civilized world? That's pretty hateful against Muslims. Well, I said that I was anti-Islam. I'm not denying that I'm anti-Islam. Yeah, but here you're saying should never let another Muslim into the civil well, well. I'm a, I'm, a, I, I'm in favor of an immigration moratorium, regardless of whether, you know, whatever you are. I don't want any more immigrants coming into this country for at least 10 years. And that's a part of my platform as a candidate. I support an immigration moratorium. Okay, but that's a different point. But like, I think specific uh, immigration policies which target specific groups is discriminatory, and we're trying to get to a world of a better place where we don't discriminate based on sex, religion, sexuality, you know, race. You know. Surely that's the place we want to get to. And it feels like I feel like you have picked this one specific area and 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 use this as a focus. But there's lots of areas where we could uh, generalize about specific groups and the harm they cause. Well, these are maybe three or four tweets that were posted years ago. And like I said, people fixate on this and this has just become what they identify me with. But I just wrote a 400 page book about my entire career of everything I've done. I mean, this is one aspect which they have, you know, through hyperbole and, you know, uh, you know, like progressive faux outrage and the help of the, you know, big tech social media tyrants helping them amplify it with algorithms. They've been able to care to commit character assassination against me. I think, and I take responsibility mm, for for my own words, yeah. right? I'm not playing victim here. I take responsibility for those tweets and I'm not going to be a coward and say, oh, I didn't tweet that, right? That's Photoshop. I tweeted those things. Yeah. I posted those things. But this is my point. It's like, don't you think, like I see them as as distasteful and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be friends with somebody who thinks like that. You know, I'm happy to do the interview, but like, I would ne- we would never be friends because if, if you think like that, that's, they're not the values I hold. And, and I, I want to live in a world where we don't discriminate based on that. I, I know plenty of Muslims who are peaceful, you know, law-abiding, uh, uh, who, who aren't discriminatory, the, who, who believe that the, uh, the laws of the country they live in... Right, and I the said I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate Muslims. But, I'm just not a fan of Islamic immigration. I don't want Islamic immigration in my country. 
I don't want really any immigration, to be totally honest. I don't. Uh, I think immigration is important for a country. I think a lot of countries have benefited from uh, I, I think right now with the current state of, you know, our country and the crisis that we're having here in the United States of America where there's already been, you know, uh, this this last reporting uh, period from the Border Patrol, over 400,000 migrants. I mean, this is just, this is an invasion. This wouldn't be acceptable in any other country. And I don't understand why the United States of America is the only country in the world that is expected to just take every single migrant but from that, a third world nation. Yeah, that, but that's not true. I mean, no, like I mean, there really you, is this, this, if you go, you know, you said you travel around the world, you know, I've been to, I've, I've traveled a lot too. I yeah. have not anymore because I refuse to get a vaccine. I don't want to get a vaccine passport, hmm. but I used to travel a lot, you know, and I've traveled to the Middle East. You ever been to Israel? No, I haven't been to Israel. You know I'd like what to happens go. if you go, if you, well, you should go to Israel someday. And you're talking about, you know, Syrians. Well, if you go to the Israeli uh, Syrian border, or the Israeli Lebanon border, or the Israeli Egyptian border, or the Israeli Gaza border, do you know what happens if you cross one inch over that borderline? You, you get, get a bullet between your eyes. Yeah, well, because Israel is a country that has particular. No, it's not. It's on both sides. Yeah. It doesn't matter because, whether you're trying to go to they're... Lebanon or Syria. If you because cross these are over. enemies. These are countries that are like sworn enemies. We in Europe, we have uh, we have people in the UK coming over all the time from France. We have there's been right, like but this huge, is the European. It's the you know you have the you. I, there's a lot of. I'm just saying it's not just again. You, you it's not just the USA. We have immigration across the world. We have people trying to escape for economic reasons or because they're trying to escape a war. Who try and move to other countries have a better life. So, so much of what I love about the UK is based on immigration. You know, where I live in Bedford is is one of the most multicultural places in the UK. We have uh, large uh, Indian communities, Italian communities, and it means we have like uh, you know. I think we have a flourishing uh, culture and society where there's a range of views and opinions and foods. And I, I personally, I love it. I think it's brilliant. My father's an Irish immigrant into the UK. The US is really a nation of immigrants. You know, I, I, I don't want to just demonize immigration, but I understand the need for control over immigration. You yeah, we have, have a, we have an immigration, immigration, immigration crisis. And I think mm. that uh, the time has come for an immigration moratorium in this, in this country uh, because we have an immigration crisis. And I think that it's... It's just totally morally reprehensible and insulting when you have Joe Biden, right? I mean, just yesterday, his administration announced that they're looking to give uh, $450,000 yeah. to every single legal alien. I mean, I don't know if you guys receive Again, stimulus it, that, checks in the UK, but we in the United States said. got... That's no, they, they want to have, give $450,000 to every illegal alien that was separated under the Trump administration. But, that, but that, again, this is a different point because you said they want to give it to every... Uh, every immigrant, every illegal alien who was separated under the Trump administration. Okay, and and I'm, I'm it's not that I agree or disagree with the point, but I'm just saying that is an entirely different point. So right. everyone to that, and so I'm clarifying it's, it's like, four hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars to every illegal alien who was separated under the Trump administration. Yeah. Well, what is what is the definition of of being separated? What being detained because you're an illegal invader and you broke our laws and crossed into our country illegally? Mm. Do you know what the salary of the United States president is? You know, I don't know. Take a guess. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it'd be particularly high. Like, is it like two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less? Four hundred thousand dollars. So they want to give. They want to give fifty thousand dollars mm. more than what the actual salary for the United States mm. president is to people who broke our laws. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is. Yeah, this I mean, is, I, I, I this personally, is problematic. Yeah, this I, is extremely problematic, and you shouldn't be demonized or banned or called a hateful individual if you speak out about this. No, right? I, no, I, I think those things are for fair debate. I, I have no issue with discussing or debating immigration. I have no issue with discussing or debating taxation, distribution right. of income. All these things I have but, no issue with. My main issue is where you, where we people want to discriminate based on. Religion, race, sex, any of these things that I think we have, as a society, especially in the developed world, seem to have uh, uh, gone past that. And to demonize all Muslims based on the actions of a specific group, I'm, I'm just not a fan of doing that. Well, you know, look, I mean, you can disagree with what I said in my tweets. I, like I said to I you, do. I'm anti Islam, I'm not anti Muslim, and I think there's a difference. And, yeah. you know, but I've already corrected it. you, yeah. I've already corrected you and explained the fact that Islam isn't a race. Right. And so okay, it's, you yes, can, you course. can, you can, but, I have no problem if you call me anti Islam. I'm owning that. I'm okay. owning it. I'm not anti Muslim, though. And, you know, 
believe it or not, but there are a lot of Muslims who support me. I ran for Congress last election cycle. I believe my that camp, would My campaign kickoff was actually held at a Muslim-owned diner with a mm. Muslim Republican woman. Uh, my friend Nahid, who's a business owner in uh, the district I ran in last election cycle, very a wonderful woman. She's a Muslim. I wasn't particularly well armed with my. That comes across as racist because I hadn't I hadn't thought it through like right. that. Right, but that's the thing is but, that but like, you are conditioned still... to think that this is racist because of the way that this has been so. I believed it was discrimination. The form of discrimination was... But you was, said it was racist. Which is a form of discrimination. But you first said it was racist. Yes, but but Laura, the point I'm making is a form of discrimination, and I don't like discrimination. So whether it's based on... Whether it's religious discrimination or racial discrimination, I just disagree with both. So I might not have had my terminology correct because I hadn't, you know, thought it through and, you know, maybe I've learned something today. But I still believe it's discrimination, and I, don't, I just don't like discrimination. Well, we can agree to disagree, right? We can agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, you know, I think that... There's there's a lot more there's a lot more to who I am as a person than just a few tweets I posted four years ago. I think and so. And to too. have my entire livelihood and my entire business and you know my career destroyed and my reputation destroyed over a couple of tweets when you know I have uh, you know a vast resume of very important you know investigative work that I've done other things that I've done. I mean it's just what. You know, a couple guys in Silicon Valley just get to decide whether they're going to delete all of that with but the click of a button we, because they dislike me. This is where we can me, agree. We, or they dislike others. And the reason I was talking about immigration too, not to not to you know get bogged down in you know policy issues, because um, that's really not the purpose of this um, of this podcast. But you know, you said, oh, I'm I have no problem having a discussion um, about immigration, right? Well, hmm. you know, they would disagree in Silicon Valley, so you know. They have no problem with the Democrats utilizing these platforms to push out uh, their agenda items, pushing out their talking points about giving $450,000 to every illegal alien who was separated under the Trump administration. Well, what about the family members who are now permanently separated from their loved ones as a result of illegal aliens murdering their family members, right? You know, there was, there was a, there was a, uh, a woman, um, there, well, there were several instances of this, um, of angel moms. I don't know if you know what an angel mom is, no. but the angel mom is what they call like the mothers of people who were murdered by illegal aliens. Okay. Right. Their accounts have been shut down by Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg for hate speech, for, for speaking out about the need for crackdowns on illegal immigration. Right. You, this is this is absolutely toxic. And so, you know, it's not just about me. It's about the millions of people, not only in America, but around the world who are being completely silenced for having completely reasonable political discussions about issues that are impacting them, whether, you know, whether it's Islam, immigration, uh, you know, COVID-19, politics, whatever it may be. And mm. I just find that to be unacceptable and I can't allow it to stand. And so you asked me what my purpose is and that's my purpose. I I want to take on the big tech social media tyrants and I want America to get back to actually being a nation that is a champion of free speech. I, agree. I don't want to live in a communist technocracy that is run by Jack Dorsey. I don't want to live in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. I definitely don't want to live in Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. That that uh, I don't me want to live under fear. a Chinese social credit score system. I don't. No, I agree, and, and and neither do I. And I think there are certain things that are happening that 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 we should be concerned about uh, happening in the UK, Australia, here in the US. I absolutely believe we should be able to debate and discuss any idea. Obviously, because I have you here, and I'm willing to discuss things with you, and I think right. it's important to have uh, open, free discussions. I still think, though, like I said, is that if you're going to be provocative, you know, and put out what is distasteful stuff, I th still make the point. I think it might be counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. I, I think, I think perhaps you've you've maybe elevated yourself beyond those kind of things. I mean, you already regretted one, and I think you probably well, regret look, those. Yeah, like, I think that I think. Look, I don't. Uh, I think that some of my, you know, provocative stunts have been more effective than others. I think that when I handcuffed myself to Twitter, you know, look, it trended number one worldwide, right? I got everyone in the world talking about big tech social media censorship mm. and the Stop the Bias movement. I think it's a big issue. You know, I mean, I created the Stop the Bias movement and it was eventually, you know, retweeted by President Donald Trump before he was banned, mm -hmm. right? This is an issue that I was able to make the number one talking point uh, during the G20 summit, right? I was able yeah. to take a conversation about big tech censorship and you know, elevate it beyond the global discussion that was happening with the world's leaders, right? The most talked about news story in the world at that moment. And so, 
you know, some I think a lot of people agree my, with you. Some, I think a lot of people agree with you on these topics. That's the point. Yeah. So my tactics, some people may laugh and say, oh, you know, she's so crazy. She handcuffed herself to Twitter. Well, my tactics are effective, right? When I put illegal aliens on Nancy Pelosi's lawn and live streamed it uh, to, you know, to highlight the Democrats hypocrisy with um, with saying, you know, everyone's welcome here and not wanting to fund a wall. That was number one. That trended number one. Right. I've I have ch- trended number one on Twitter over five times while you're banned <laughs> while I've been banned and that's an accomplishment I think to that have is an accomplishment. hundreds of millions of people you know seeing your message through guerrilla journalism or guerrilla activism that's effective it might not be everyone's cup of tea but it's certainly mine and I stand by my tactics so so what what is it you want to see happen what like what what would be effective change for you well I would love to see Section 230 repealed. I would okay. I would love to see Section 230 repealed, but I don't think that's ever really going to happen until, you know, somebody like me is elected to Congress because unfortunately we have, you know, people on both sides of the aisle in our government who are taking money from big tech, right? It's not just Democrats, it's Republicans. And so it's too beneficial for them, you know, when they can call up their buddies in Silicon Valley and which we know they do and, and have them suppress stories like they did with the Hunter Biden scandal this last election cycle, right? Mm-hmm. It's too beneficial for them to ever want to re- uh, repeal Section 230. But I also want to see these these executives be held accountable. I do believe that Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg should be sent to prison. Okay, big statements. I think that they, you know, you talk about laws and you were just giving me this, you know, big, um, you know, retort about uh, how Tommy Robinson broke the law. Mm-hmm. Well, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg broke the law. Which law and did Sundar they break? Pakai. You know, it's illegal in the United States of America to lie to Congress. It's called perjury. Mm-hmm. And you can be sent to prison for committing perjury. What, so and they what testified lies? to Congress. They testified to Congress during multiple tech hearings, and they said that they were not implementing uh, algorithms to censor and politically target conservatives. Well, we now know because of these undercover Project Veritas tapes, right, where I used to work um that that uh they are they actually are uh implementing talk talk to me about this project veritas investigation what happened i'm not a huge fan of project veritas but oh really yeah why not because i think uh i I don't always like the tactics and uh i but they're effective see it's always their tactics but they are effective Uh, people speak the truth when they don't realize they're being recorded i'm not sure how much it is about James O'Keefe's uh, uh, ego. He wrote the foreword for my book. I'm not sure how much it's about his ego uh, or it's about actually finding the truth. And also it's just, it's never, it never really feels like objective. So it always feels like it's just like very one-sided. I just, I just, I've never really particularly liked it. It's not the kind of journalism I like. Well, look, they, they what, what also they have out? a lot of whistleblowers who have come forward, right? Yeah. So they, um, I actually, when I was working for Project Veritas, I, you know, recruited the journalists who ended up going undercover in the Twitter investigation. And so, you know, since then, they've had a lot of whistleblowers who have come forward and exposed the fact that, you know, they are uh, abusing their dangerous individuals list, of course, which, you know, you see Facebook labeled me a da- I was one of the first they labeled a dangerous individual. Uh, Twitter had algorithms in which they had special keywords like, guns, America, Trump, USA, and you have Twitter employees on camera saying, oh, those are like redneck, trashy Trump supporters, and those are automatic bans, right? Um, You know, you have uh, Twitter employees on camera talking about how, um, you know, they would, um, you know, they would, they would uh, be in favor of blackmailing conservative politicians and reading their DMs and then like releasing that information to the press in an effort to take down their political enemies. I mean, these are all, these are all videos that you can watch that are online with Project Veritas. So, you know, they, they have Mark Zuckerberg on video from one of his um, internal meetings admitting that, yeah, like our company actually does have too much power and we actually aren't abiding by our own terms of service. Yeah, I mean, but they have but, them but, admitting but, this. But what's he saying? What's the context of what he's saying? Is he admitting it, saying we need to change what we do? No, he's saying we are not following our yeah. own terms of service. This is this is definitely one of those Mark, situations. Come on. We know Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want to change anything. The only thing he's going to be changing is his is his name of his company. Yeah. Right. What is it? What does it stand for? Meta. Mark evading uh, true accountability. Right? <laughs> There's Mark, a lot of memes Mark about evading this. true accountability. Mark extraterrestrial alien. There's right. a lot of memes. This is one of those ones where I feel like like I I need a person here with Ma- a screen. Manipulating everyone through advertising, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh. 
That's quite a good one. That I mean, one. he's a liar. Uh, I mean, look, I yeah, I used to work in advertising. I know what av- you know, advertising model does to support certain industries. But like, this is one that I almost feel like I, I we could have done with a screen and going through some of this stuff and fact checking or talking about it as it happened because there's a lot here you've gone through that I'm like, okay, I need to go and research this. I need to go and read more about this and yeah. understand what it is. Um, but I'm what I will say is like I am troubled by uh, the censorship on big tech on social media and Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned about how some of the conversations with regards to COVID have been closed down. Uh, I have been concerned with, uh, I'm concerned with the banning of Donald Trump. I think banning the uh, president of a country during an election is particularly troubling. I'm troubled with YouTube videos uh, going down. My thing is, it's like, I also think Laura, it's like, where are we headed here with like, what, where do we head here with this? Because Everything is like conflict now. Everyone is like hating each other for X, Y, and Z. <laughs> Everyone is fighting. And it's we're in a really shitty place. Well, as I like to say, the final variant is communism. The final variant is communism. Yeah. And uh, what was it? What was your other acronym? Marxism? Uh, what was it? What did I say? I just made up on the spot. You said... Uh, uh, Marxism entering enters, the arena. Yeah, entering Marxism the, enters the arena. Marxism enters the arena. That's what this is all about. I mean, look, these companies, these companies, when you look at the wealth that they have, they are wealthier than some countries. Okay, they have yeah. they have a higher wealth than some countries' GDP. And what we're seeing right now is is a full blown co- Marxist communist revolution, and we are do all you going really to yes, I do, that? I do. These big tech social media companies, where 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 we are headed, we are headed for a full blown globalist technocratic rule, and that's why Mark Zuckerberg. It's so creepy. I mean, even Jack Dorsey. I mean, the only time I found myself agreeing with Jack Dorsey, he thought it was ridiculous. He thought it was ridiculous. This idea of the metaverse. I mean, it's. You know, this guy is on a power trip, this Mark Zuckerberg. He thinks that he's the ruler of the world. And, and, um, I think he's, I think he's a businessman thinking, where does my business go next? And the thing he's creating is ultimately going to be a lot of fun for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But like the internet, the metaverse will have a whole load of issues with it as well. And we'll be worried about the creepy places in it. And we'll be worried about the impact on kids and, you know, people going in like, they, they can live this miserable, shitty life and they go to the metaverse and suddenly be a superhero and then they're not right. going to want to leave because they're not going to want to go back to their miserable, shitty right. life. Uh, it's, it's just a weird thing. I'm not sure Mark Zuckerberg wants to bring in a new era of communism. Though. So what happens when you die in the metaverse? Do you die in real life? What I happens know. when you get banned in the metaverse? Do you get banned in real life? Well, that's they are, they are interesting questions we have to work through. You know, I haven't thought about that. If you die in the metaverse, I think... You die in real life? No, I don't think no, so. No, I think that's where we're headed. I really, really? do. I think that's where we're headed. And we're speaking into the of Matrix. Bitcoin, when you do you remember uh, Mark Zuckerberg's Libra project? Yes, I do remember that. <laughs> so um, that's where we're headed. You know, Mark Zuckerberg um, had uh, representatives from Libra testify, and I'll, I, I sent you the article. You can mm-hmm. look this up. Um, and they were they were asked by a member of Congress. You know, you just designated Laura Loomer, Alex Jones, and Milo Yiannopoulos as dangerous individuals. Under your dangerous individuals policy, are these same individuals going to be denied from using Libra? And they said, we'll have to get back to you on that. We don't know. So you might Which means able. they're thinking about it. Yeah. They're thinking about it. They're thinking of weaponizing what is supposed to be decentralized currency to keep people who they disagree with politically or people who they view as their political opponents or dissidents as second-class citizens to keep them out, to financially disenfranchise them. Right to keep them out of, you know, so the you might, world, you might not get in the, the metaverse, metaverse that that these people would like to see. You might not get in the metaverse. Then. Oh, I'm definitely not going to be. You know how how you know we talked about Uber, and I can understand, <laughs> I can understand why Uber and Lyft banned you because I thought what you said was particularly distasteful. But you know, I can understand why. But that why did for. Uber Eats ban me? <laughs> I, 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 want, I, I wonder if it's like you're banned from one, banned from all. Right, that's from the, the other. That's that's what it works. That's like. the one ban though that you know I get sympathy for is Uber Eats. I mean, how the hell do you get banned from Uber Eats, right? I don't. I don't. I know. don't know. I still don't know. Twitter. Um, the specific tweet. I, I, my assumption is not that. I found some of your other stuff distasteful. I mean, if you came on here ranting some of those things now you were saying them now standing by them i'd probably in the interview i'd probably let me finish i'd probably be like you know what laura i just don't want to carry this on because i don't want to hear that kind of stuff like people have choices um but but i'm not sure you know i'm not sure why they banned you uh 
what what banking services did you get uh, banned from? It was so cash. I was shut down from Chase Online Banking. When did that happen? That happened in 2019. And then I what, was... What, what led up to that? Do you know... Did so they I was what? actually in a cab in New York City and I was on my way to Twitter headquarters to go protest, right? Mm -hmm. This was another protest that I had orchestrated. And I tried to um, pay for my, um, my cab and my card was declined. Okay. And then I went on my online banking and I said that I had been, you know, uh, suspended from Chase Online Banking, right? And then uh, several of my friends who were also high profile... Um, you know, conservative pro-Trump activists had also been banned that same week. Um, and so I told James O'Keefe about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they sent an undercover reporter um, into the Chase Bank and they got them on video saying, yeah, we were instructed to not give uh, banking access to people who don't have moral character. Okay. So that's where we're at in a country right now. Yeah, I mean, that happens. That's where we're at a country. Well, that's been happening for a long time because also. It's happened the, to the crypto community. Well, the bank, the, yeah, it's happened to the crypto community. Also, sex workers have been debanked uh, just for working. <laughs> you know, I, I, there's people who work in the adult uh, industry, adult performers who've been debanked because the banks say this is not uh, an industry they want to support, despite it being legal. And so these you know, sex workers can't access banking services and some have gone to crypto and Bitcoin. Um, there's like these moral judgments made against you know, who should be a customer, who shouldn't be a customer. It feels like you maybe you became uh, someone whose card was marked and nobody wanted anything to do with you. Like a bit like uh, these, uh, it seems to be sometimes when somebody gets banned, they seem to sweep through all the different yeah. platforms and get banned from them all. It feels like that happened. Yeah, well, probably. I mean, because they used it as a justification. And whenever I get banned somewhere else, they always cite like, oh, she was banned on Twitter and Facebook and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's yeah. like on and on and on. But is it justified? No. Um, I think that, you know, it's a form of political retaliation, a form of, you say you're anti-discrimination, a form of discrimination, because I am a very outspoken and effective um, conservative activist, really. I do believe that conservatives are being discriminated against. Um, I do feel like, uh, as somebody who enjoys visiting conservative states, I enjoy Texas, Wyoming, uh, Florida, New Hampshire. I've, I've enjoyed them all and I, I like spending time there. But I like time. I like my time here in New York as well, in LA. But um, I, I feel like sometimes the word conservative is used pejoratively. And I, I, I actually support some... Uh, uh, conservative ideas, so certainly on the uh, eco economic side. I spent some time at, at Governor Abbott's mansion and got to hear what he was doing for the economy within uh, within Texas. And like he was like, we're open for business, and it was really interesting to hear. Um, and I do feel like there is this kind of there is this this kind of position where people from the left look down at people conservatives as almost like. Well, actually, I think it happens both sides. I say that happens <laughs> both sides, but it feels like uh, being a strong conservative is morally wrong. Well, because we're living in a time right now where the big tech social media companies, along with you know the the Democrats who are now you know in control of our full blown opposition government, are encouraging are encouraging people to treat conservatives like second class citizens. You know, and so when you have people like Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and Sundar Pakai and others, you know, uh, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, who are admittedly, you know, anti-conservative, right? It's not like they're hiding their political opinions, right? Mm -hmm. we, all, we have all seen the candidates that Jack Dorsey has donated to. We've all seen, you know, the fact that Mark Zuckerberg just gave $400 million to predominantly Mark Zuckerberg gave $6.4 million to the election supervisor in the district where I was running. You know why he gave that money? Because Donald Trump and I were both on the ballot and we were probably the two most anti-big tech candidates in the country. There was no reason to give $6.4 million of aid to Palm Beach County, the third wealthiest county in America. He claims that he gave it to counties that were in need of resources for COVID assistance. There was no need. This is election interference. This is election interference. And so when you have these people, the most powerful people in the world, working hand in hand with the Democrats and saying, you know, our patience is wearing thin with you, as Joe Biden said during his speech about the unvaccinated. Oh, when the economy crashes, you blame the unvaccinated, like Joe Biden said. Of course, people are going to look down on conservatives, right? I mean, you had Hillary Clinton, who ran her entire presidential campaign, calling half of America deplorable as if we're dirty and disgusting simply because of what we believe in. Well, I find 
I find it very frustrating that someone who comes in spends a lot of time in different states, meeting different people, whether they're left or right, everyone's completely nice. And I, and I feel like a lot of this is stoked by the media and social media and politicians themselves. And I just find it all a little bit disappointed. Why do, where are the people who are trying to bring unity back? Where are the people who are trying to, trying to bring some cohesion back? Because I, the experience you get from the social media, the news... And the politicians is entirely different from my experience spending time here. You know, it's almost like everyone has monetized the game of division. Yeah, well, you know, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that statement. Um, and but, uh, but, but could you also be part of the problem if you're going into politics and you're constantly pointing out the failings and the flaws of everyone else without actually, you know, also having some concessions yourself to actually try and bring some, like how would you bring a little bit more unity in? Because if <laughs> you are- isn't about me. I'm you, running to represent people who need a voice who are not being represented right now. You're not really though. You're meant to represent people who vote for you and people who don't vote for you as a as an elected no, leader. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm, I'm running to represent people, the, the residents of District 11 in Florida yeah. who are not receiving proper representation right now. Mm. Those are those are conservatives and Democrats. Yeah. You know, those are, I'm saying the constituents. But how do, how, everybody. how do you, you know, how do you bring like a more cohesive future together when if you are elected? Well, you know, I think that it, it goes back to restoring you know, constitutional values mm -hmm. in our country. We have representatives right now who are so polarized, and I agree with you that everybody is so caught up in their own, you know, political ideology that they are betraying the Constitution. And so I'm running for Congress as a constitutional conservative because I, just like you said, what the solution was with Big Tech, I don't think that we would have all this division and we wouldn't have all of the animosity and the hatred if we got back to governing our country according to the United States Constitution. Right. I think you a lot have, of people would agree with you. You have people that. say no one is above the law, like Nancy Pelosi says, right? We had a conversation about the law. Well, you know, you're not really following the law when uh, you know, when you're interfering in elections and you're, you know, using your relationships with big tech to to silence your political opponents or, you know, illegally surveil people violating the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution by utilizing Facebook and Twitter to, you know, provide you know, information without a warrant. You're not exactly following the law when you're allowing for, you know, thousands of migrants to come into our country. I mean, look, there's there's people on both sides of the aisle. I mean, you have hypocrites in the Republican Party too who are taking money from big tech while they issue, you know, stump speeches talking about how they're so anti-big tech, right? But as an investigative journalist, I really am concerned with the truth. And if you've noticed, you know, I'm disliked by Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. and I'm a Republican. Well, but that comes back to that point where but, maybe sometimes it's because of the things you've done are particularly distasteful. No, it has nothing to do with those statements. It has everything to do with my tactics because I'm, you know, pretty aggressive, right? I think we could admit that. Mm -hmm. I'm aggressive and I, you know, call things for, for as I see them, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't care whether you're on the right or the left. If I have a problem with something that you're doing or I think that it's, you know, it's wrong or unethical, um, you know, I call it out. And so I think that um, I think that you're right with regards to the division and the animosity, but we can really fix that if we get back to actually upholding the law and, you know, following the Constitution. Because right now in America, I really do believe that we have a two-tiered justice system. That I would agree with. Expand on that, though. So, <laughs> you know, we, we have different different laws for different people or different implementation of the law. It used to be that, you know, it was like the elitist versus, you know, the common people, right? And you would see people, you know, in the upper echelons of society, right? Maybe not, you know, face the same type of punishments. But now we're seeing a two-tiered justice system according to your political ideology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you brought up January 6th, for example, right? <laughs> and um, you called it an incitement to violence. Well, you know, did, did, I'm not sure I'd, I'd said that. Well, you I think, said that they I were said, banned. I think that was the accusation. The accusations, right? And, it, and, it and this did is end what up, Big Tech is saying, that it's an incitement to violence. But it right? did end up becoming a violent event. <laughs> there was uh, shots fired, someone was killed. Yeah, do you know who thrown. fired the shots? Yeah, it was somebody inside. No, it was a police officer. Yeah, inside the building. Yeah, it was a police yeah. officer who shot and killed an unarmed Trump supporter who was wrapped inside a, a Trump flag. Her name was Ashley Babbitt, and she was an Air Force veteran. Yeah, so... I've seen the footage and it's horrible, um, but I've got no idea what the rules he is governed by, what, what his uh, duties are to protect uh, the Capitol building when he's inside. So I can't answer that. But but s still, 
there was a whatever you want to call it it was a violent act there were people trying to rush the building and yeah you know, well that 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 building belongs to the people so i don't really yeah. i i really honestly have a big problem with people calling january 6 an insurrection because the the capital belongs to the people. It's called the people's house, mm -hmm. right? Our taxpayer dollars pay for that. And as somebody who made a career, you know, going to Capitol Hill confronting politicians, <laughs> I'll tell you firsthand, there's no such thing as storming the Capitol. Anybody can get inside the Capitol. You go through security. And from the videos that are now coming out, you know, it shows that police officers literally let protesters inside the Capitol. Um, and so, you know, you, you said they led to violence, yeah. Well, this is what I mean by a two-tiered justice system. <laughs> so you have Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg banning Donald Trump and so many of his supporters. Jack, Jack Dorsey, um, you know, said that he couldn't allow for incitement to violence to continue on, on his platform, right? So he banned President Trump. Mark Zuckerberg said the same thing. Mark Zuckerberg was going through, I don't know how they were doing this, right? But they must have some, you know, type of technology to do it. They were tracking down people through, um, I guess through AI and taking photos of people who were attending the rally on January 6th and going into their messages and turning them over to the FBI without a warrant. That's illegal. You can't do that, okay? That's an abuse of power. But where were they when Black Lives Matter and Antifa spent the entire last summer burning down American cities and, and uh, you know, protesting in support of a degenerate uh, drug addict named George Floyd, right, who, who ended up dying while he was resisting police arrest? Over, do you know how much money? Look, I know. Look, it's a, it's a, hey, heated, listen, it's a listen. heated, it's a heated, it's a heated Laura, thing to say, but Laura, this is, this Laura, is. Laura, listen, I've. I've seen the video footage and I also know about his background and I don't understand why George <laughs> Floyd was given a statue. It seemed he lived a bit of a shitty life, treated some okay. people shitty. Yeah. He was still a father and he was, yeah. you know, uh, I, I think we can all agree that what happened to him was wrong still. Regardless of whether you agree with that or not, you said exactly what I was getting to. He's not worthy of members of Congress giving him and taking a knee in Congress for him. He's not worthy of multinational corporations. A... Uh, you know, he's not worthy of being nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize like, uh, like Black Lives Matter and those who were, you know, protesting for George Floyd were. I mean, this is just. Just this is just a perfect example of why Americans are so pissed off. Why people have so much animosity right now. Do you when know why it is? I think very few people are willing to concede and take a middle ground. Uh, I think most people want to take once everything is politicized in this country now, and it's really easy for me to see as somebody comes in from the UK. Like we we haven't politicized COVID. If you don't wear a mask or you want to get vaccinated, it's got nothing to do with whether you're a conservative or a Labour supporter or a Liberal Democrat. <laughs> this, it just doesn't exist. We don't politicize every single issue. You do here in the US, you politicize everything in a single issue. And it's really rough to watch. Well, because you can thank big tech for that because I, they amplify the politicization. And that's what I was getting to with well, George Floyd. Actually, so, if you let me just finish what I was trying hmm. to say really quick because I want to make this point. They banned Donald Trump and his supporters after January 6th because they said it was an incitement to violence. Jack Dorsey put the the black power fist in his profile on Twitter and he the official Twitter profile like the official Twitter account for Twitter put the black fist with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, take a guess as to how much damage they caused throughout the entire country during their so-called summer of love. Well, I mean, it no, but I just want to I want to show the comparison and the hypocrisy because this is this is this is exactly what my problem is with these big tech social media companies. Take a guess. I want you to take a guess how much damage was caused during January 6th and Black Lives Matter Summer of Love. I, I don't know. How, how, how would I know that? I wouldn't know that. OK, one billion dollars of property damage was carried out by Black Lives Matter during mm -hmm. the Summer of Love. People died. People were shot. People were killed in these, you know, Antifa, Black Lives Matter uh, zones like CHOP that were were popping popping up. I'm sure which, have you heard of the CHOP yeah, zone. Yeah, which was dumb. Yeah, it was dumb. At least we can yeah. agree on that. Okay, in comparison, how much property damage was caused at the Capitol? No, look. 1.5 million. But you're not comparing apples and apples here. They're completely two different things. And, and I, like, I don't think you need to compare them to, to, to make the point. I think... Uh, I think it's very easy to look at what happened with Black Lives Matters and see there are a number of people who felt like 
uh, black people are routinely uh, discriminated against. That's or, not the or, point, though. Uh, no, no, but what I'm saying is, like, people just got fed up and they protested. And I think you can support the protests and also at the same time say, oh, look, I support these protests. There's hypocrisy here around protests, like we're in lockdown, but it's okay to protest COVID. We shouldn't be out. We shouldn't be supporting people damaging the buildings. Like I think you can take a nuanced view and you can knit your way through these things and go, this is right, this is wrong. This like you can just use common sense. But I come to the US and I struggle to find that. I find people who just want to go. I'm on this side, so I'm fighting for this team, or I'm on this side, so I'm fighting for this team. And I myself is just trying to knit through this. And I think with common sense, with almost every scenario, you can say this is right and this is wrong. Well, that's that's because this is this is all because of big tech. This is all because no, of people. No, no, this, no, it really is though. No, because Laura, these Laura, are the these are the distributors of, of of information. And if you're in the middle of a lockdown, okay, and you're only able to communicate, if you're being told that you're going to be arrested for going outside, and and the president of the United States and the first lady. Are are encouraging you to use social media to communicate. And the leaders of these social media companies are taking political stances by banning the president, but putting Black Lives Matter and the Black Power Fist in their bio. You know, that is a problem. And that is why I believe so much division and animosity has spread in this country. I do believe that these big tech social media companies are national security threats. I think that they uh, they 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 foment and they they prop up domestic and foreign terrorist organizations that that promote actual insurrections against the United States of America. Uh, I, I think that they intentionally um, create hostility and division by banning high profile political leaders and discriminating against certain people within certain political affiliations so that this hostility is created. I do believe they intentionally do it. I, I agree with and you. And the evidence on a, supports my, my claims. And I agree with you on a number of the issues with regards to big tech, but there was political division before there was social media. This is what I believe is a uh, an endemic issue within the U.S. ever since the media companies split down political lines after Roger Ailes has created Fox News and created a Republican station, and uh, and you then got this division, and people monetize by selling ad dollars. Uh, monetized division. And I believe Fox News is as complicit as CNBC. Look, I hate Fox News. Yeah, but my point is, like both sides, what I'm saying is they've monetized division. But everybody else can take responsibility for themselves. I can, you can, Jeremy can, every political leader, everybody who has a role in society can choose to do their own research and, and, and opt out of this and, and try and do something which is more cohesive and work together. Everyone has a choice to do that. So we can blame political parties. We can blame TV networks. We can blame social platforms for their contribution. We as individuals have a choice. And we have a choice that we either be part of this or, or we're not. And we try and be a more cohesive society, which brings me all the way back to Bitcoin and says why I like Bitcoin because Bitcoin is neither left, it's not right, and it brings us together. And that's why I like that because it's like we don't need all this political bullshit. Mm -hmm. We can build a productive society by volunteering to work with each other using a new form of money. And, and that's what I like. Yeah, I like it too. I like it too. And that's why, you know, I'm, you know, not only in my you know professional career as a deplatformed activist and journalist was I utilizing Bitcoin, but also too I'm proud that I was one of the only candidates in the country last election cycle that utilized Bitcoin mm -hmm. in my campaign, and I was actively promoting Bitcoin. And I was one of the only candidates in the nation, and I believe I still am, that is accepting Bitcoin contributions for my campaign because I really do believe that Bitcoin is the future. When's when's the is it you campaigning for the next primaries? For the primary. When is that? May is it? No, my Florida has one of the latest primaries. So the primary is August 23rd. Oh, so 23rd. I'm I'm primarying a Republican. I decided to run against a Republican instead of a Democrat this time. Who are you running against? Do nothing, Dan Webster. Do nothing, Dan. Just the other thing, guys, you all you fucking guys just attack each other. The thing that, that signifies one of the biggest problems, I think, in US politics, and I've seen it seep into British politics recently with the, uh, the Labour, what happened with the Labour Party and Keir Starmer, but is this, you'll get a bunch of Republicans on stage together and they'll attack the shit out of each other to try and win the nomination and then they'll pick one of those people they were shitting on to work with. And it's just like, this is such bullshit. Like people, like most of the time, politicians are attacking other people rather than talking about their own policies. And I'm, I'm aware because I met somebody yeah. who's running for Congress in Kentucky and she said she gets this report every Friday that's like every little detail about her opposition, like everything he's doing so she can attack him. It's just like... This stuff is shit. <laughs> this yeah. is like horrible. This is 
this isn't building a cohesive society. This is all about attack, attack, yeah. attack. One of your, one of your, um, one of your politicians in the UK was just attacked. He lost his life. Didn't I know. He? Terrible. Yeah. It's dreadful. There's two Islamic terrorists killed him. That's two in five years. Two, uh, two people, two politicians have been killed in five years. I could try and remember who the other one was. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's terrible. Like yeah, it's every terrible. murder is terrible, whether yeah. it's a murder by a Christian. Or a Jewish right, person. Right, I'm just emphasizing the fact a, that the politician a, in the UK was killed by an Islamic terrorist. Yeah, and I, I can't remember who the other one was killed by. I believe it was a. I don't believe um, the last I one. I believe that the guy was a Somali immigrant, actually, to the United Kingdom, who just murdered your yeah. a recent politician in the UK. Uh, we'll look it up. Let's have a look. Murdered uh, member of Parliament because there were two. That, I can't remember her name. Joe. This one was was murdered by a Somalian. Joe Cox uh, died of being shot and stabbed multiple times in Burstall. This was the previous one. By who? Uh, uh, November by 53-year-old Thomas Alexander Mir. Now, I don't want to mm. jump to conclusions. He might also be, um, let's see what he is, perpetrator. The perpetrator was Thomas Alexander Mir, 53-year-old, unemployed gunner, born in Scotland, um, had mayor had mental health problems, was declared sane at the moment of the crime. He believed the individuals of the liberal and left-wing political viewpoints and the mainstream media were the cause of the world's problems. You know, we can't just pick out the ones where Look, it's... political uh, violence is a problem. And, yes. you know, you, I, I am a... I am, but you just went to pick out the Islamic one. You uh, forgot Joe Cox. Well, I was just trying to be... Yeah, kind of, I was trying to be snarky. Yeah, but it's just like... It's like I just, Oh, I just, but look, you know, I am ugh. against political violence, you mm. know, and, and one of the things that, um, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, first, you know, was the result of my, you know, Twitter following when I mm -hmm. first, you know, became known on Twitter was when I stormed the stage of that Shakespeare in the Park play in I New saw. York City because they were inciting political violence, and I mm. said, stop the normalization of political violence against the right. And so, look, I don't, so I don't to, advocate want, for political you want sense, violence. You want a sense of creativity. No, I'm not censoring creativity. There's a, it's a felony in the United States of America. We're talking about following the law, right? It's a felony in the United States of America to incite, um, to incite violence against the president, and it's not protected through the arts. That's why Kathy Griffin but, received but, so, a visit from Secret Service when yeah. she held that severed head of Donald Trump. No, I don't know the full details it's of a it. Felony. Like, no, no, no. Like, is it, was this not considered a piece of creative work? Is it? I don't is think it your that it's a piece of creative work when you intentionally give uh, Caesar's wife, you know, an Eastern European ac accent to look like Melania, and then you have Caesar with, you know, a hairstyle that looks exactly like Donald Trump's. And you is, know. It, is that not satire rather than incitement? No, they were they were glorifying the stabbing and the killing of, mm. of Donald Trump and the crowd. It was sick. I attended it. Oh, no, I, I it mean, was, I, it, the I've thing seen that the was video. The thing about it is, is they were paying for that production with taxpayer funds. Mm -hmm. And there, there are conservatives, believe it or not, who live in New York. I used to live in New York. And they don't want their taxpayer dollars, and nor should they have their taxpayer dollars going towards funding a play that is essentially assassination porn of their elected president. Mm. <sighs> but you know, there's a lot to talk about. You'll read about it all in the book. I'm gonna maybe, go. I'm gonna you know, go and maybe, read the book. Maybe you'll have some different thoughts about my tactics after you read the book. No, look, I don't disagree with all of your tactics. I, I, I think I've been pretty clear what I do and don't like and what I disagree with. Yeah, and, and most no, and you're of all, fair. Yeah, and, and I wish more people were like you. I really actually think, I know you're going to get a lot of shit for doing yeah, this podcast, I but I actually really respect the fact, even if you do think that some of my things are distasteful, I have respect for you because yeah, no, I, you are not simply, you know, talking shit and subtweeting me on Twitter or, or you know, having me, yeah. you know, I wasn't too fond <laughs> of you, you know, stopping stopping my confrontation with Dorsey because I thought that it was important. But well, like, but that had to end at some point. Right. You know, but and there was, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, like we had a program to run and you, you made your point and. Oh, it was more, it was way more entertaining than the program they were running. Let's yeah. Be but, but I'm saying it like, it, it wasn't going anywhere. It, like it needed, if it's going to ha happen or work, it needs to be mediated. You made some points, he made right. some points. If I hadn't have uh, taken you out, the security was going to drag you out. So. I'm like that's that's why. Yeah, well, you know, I I think that I think that um, I think that more people should you know take you as an example for how they should communicate and interact with people who they disagree with. I think that we've had you know a really productive conversation, and we you know sometimes text back and forth too, and you know we we have these productive conversations because it's good for people to be able to see you know opposing viewpoints. And so I view myself; I consider myself to be a free speech absolutist, right? 
yeah, I might be, you know, politically on the right wing, mm -hmm. but I'm not looking to silence and censor the viewpoints of the left, right? I think that, you know, people should be able to uh, say what they want to say, do what they want to do, express themselves, no matter how offensive it may be. Well, all I know is from this interview that's made me realize is that if I'm going studio-based, I need somebody else with a laptop and a screen, being able to go through some of the points to kind of fact check. Because you've brought so many things up today which we should have reviewed, talked about, fact checked, looked at, which I think is really important to have these conversations. Like, it's, it's super important. Like the Tommy Robinson thing, you know, just to understand what the law was regarding that. Right. So, uh, but I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. It's good to meet you. We've got no, to prepare for the next interview it's, coming it's in. It's good. It was good to meet you. And, you know, I am deplatformed, but... Um, you know, I encourage people, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you gave me this opportunity, and people do have strong opinions about me. But if you do want to, you know, understand, you know, my arguments in, in more depth, because it's kind of hard to, you know, convey all of this in, the, mm -hmm. in this, you know, short time span, you should read my book. You should go and you should order my book. It's called Loomered, How I Became the Most Banned Woman in the World. We have it here. Show it. And, uh, you know, it gets into all these different arguments, and it's not just about me. I talk about a lot of the different issues that are facing people all around the world right now with the big tech social media tyranny. Um, and so um, also if people are interested in following me because I'm, you know, not on these traditional social media sites, they can follow me on Parler. I'm on Gab. I'm on Telegram. Um, I'm on that site, Getter. And uh, another site that I think that you should look into and um, – that I would encourage uh, people in the Bitcoin community to join is this uh, new, actually decentralized platform called Bastion, mm -hmm. right? And so somebody's brought that up to me. You should, yeah. yeah. So I'm on Bastion, and so you know, I I agree with um, that the future and communication in the future is going to revolve around decentralized social media platforms, and so I'm utilizing Bastion, and that's where I'm able to post my content completely uncensored, and you are actually able to earn cryptocurrency. Um, you know, shit coins. Well, utilizing, well, it's called P coin. It's, it's I know that I know, but but it's, it's a shit coin. But regardless, though, I think that you know I have been an advocate for decentralized platforms yeah. as well, and so that's why you know when Dorsey, um, you know, mentioned his creation or his goals to create a decentralized platform, I agree with that. I think mm. that we need to have more decentralized communication and more decentralized um, technology. I think that that's the solution to censorship, and that's why I'm a proud supporter of of Bitcoin. Well, good, and I will read your book, and I'm sure I will yeah. be back in touch and tell you what I agree yeah. or disagree with. But I'm definitely gonna, I'm gonna. This, I don't often listen back to my interviews because I hate hearing myself. I just, I just don't like it. Uh, but some of this I'm gonna have to go through because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what's right and what's wrong because, yeah. because you make really good points, but I don't, I don't know what's true and what isn't, and I need to research it. So, you know, the fact that like you referred to Tommy Robinson and. The things I do understand, because from my country and mm -hmm. no go zones, I know they're, they're I know you're wrong about those things. So like, I just need to fact check the other things. But uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. I might Thank not you. agree with you. Yeah, uh, and also if people want to support my uh, my my congressional campaign and send a message to big tech, which you know has deplatformed my campaign, they have mm -hmm. made the decision to deplatform my campaign. That it's the American people who should pick and choose election winners and losers, not big tech. You can go to lauralumerforcongress.com and make a campaign donation in Bitcoin. Today. Good pitch. All right, yeah. leave it with me. I'm sure we're going to talk again. Um, we finally got here, and uh, I will be watching your campaign with interest. Um, thank, thank you for you. the book. Uh, let's see where we go from here. Yeah, well, Good thanks luck. for having me. Thank, thank you. you.